Hi everyone, thank you very much for joining from all over the world. Welcome to 2020 NOVA Virtual Conference, the first online conference organized by NOVA MBA Association. As many of you know, NOVA MBA is a nonprofit organization founded 20 years ago in the United States with the support of Italian business leaders. The association brings together over 2,000 MBA students and alumni from the top business school around the world. Every year, alumni and students get together in an annual physical conference to reflect and discuss about the Italian business environment with Italian CEOs and leaders. Due to the constraints brought by the global pandemic, this year, NOVA, with the support of Italian students from MIT, Harvard, Columbia, and London Business School, decided to shift the annual reunion online, a unique event that not only aims at bringing together the NOVA community, but also celebrating the 20th anniversary of the association, as well as the new partnership with Mentors for You, the largest European mentoring community founded by two NOVA alumni. As you can see from the agenda on the screen, Technology did not prevent us from hosting outstanding speakers with remarkable career and recognition among both the Italian and international business community. Today, our speakers will talk about the concept of responsible leadership and the challenges that leaders of today need to face while trying to combine responsibility with courage, knowledge with innovation, to cope in a world in rapid transformation. We'll start with the first keynote speech from Mr. Paul Pullman. Afterwards, the chairman and president of NOVA, together with the two founders of Mentors for You, will present the new initiatives of the association. A second keynote speech from Mr. Vittorio Colau will follow. After a short break, you will have the chance to hear two speakers' panel from 5 to 5.50 p.m. lighting up the future, the next frontier of energy, with remarkable speakers from the energy sector. From 5.50 to 6.45 p.m., rethinking our world through digital innovation, with outstanding leaders from the digital and technology space. We'll then conclude with some closing remarks. I'm now going to pause here and introduce the first speaker of the event, Mr. Paul Polman. Of course, no need for any long introduction, but as you know, he's the co-founder and current chair of Imagine and former CEO of Unilever. He will join us today from the Franklin University of Lugano. Not only is one of the most successful CEO of the past decade, but he's also a leader with strong commitment towards sustainability. He will inspire us today with his perspective on responsible leadership. Mr. Poldman, we are very honored and delighted to have you with us today. I will now leave you the floor. Thank you very much for this introduction. We'll just introduce our collaboration here with the Franklin University. My name is Barbara Bulls, and I'm ambassador of the Reboot the Future, co-founded with the Kim Polman. And I, it, our mission is to co-create a more compassionate and sustainable work through new conversations and education. And we are especially excited to be here part as both the conference NOVA and as a bridge to the Master's in Management course in Responsible Management here at the Franklin University. And none of this bringing the leaders like Paul Polman, the Franklin University, and the NOVA conference is the coincidence. And as the poll has already been introduced and does not need any introduction, I think it's especially important to know that in his role in the Imagine, he is building a new coalition of CEOs in various sectors of economy for systems transformation. Okay, happy to be in Franklin and thanks for uh, the opportunity. And obviously uh, the NOVA annual summit, I want to thank uh, Elisa and Barbara and um, happy to hear actually that my good friend Vittorio, who used to be on my board at Unilever when I was there, is actually the second speaker. So we'll talk a little bit about where we find ourselves in today's world, if you want to, and then the systems changes that are needed, because that's the most important thing I want to focus on. And one thing is for sure, we need all of us, because the things that we have to move are not going to be easy. Otherwise, someone would have done it before us already. So with you wonderfully here at Franklin and the 2,000 plus uh, people, alumni, Italian alumni from NOVA, please, you know, I will actually explain to you all the things you didn't learn in business school. And I wish business schools would have taught it and we wouldn't have been in such a problem. And even if you come from Harvard, don't think you're excluded. Mm -hmm. So 
No question that we live in the most challenging times. You know, Dick and Stockton in his book, The Tale of Two Cities, it's the best of times, it's the worst of times. We actually have seen an enormous growth in prosperity over the last three, four decades. 600 million people lifted out of poverty. But what is also very clear is that the way we did this is not clearly sustainable. We're starting to discover that more and more. So best time to be born, without any doubt. People live longer, healthier lives, more people access to education, more people access to healthcare, despite what we're going through right now, people living longer, healthier lives. It's great to be young. But we do need to change some things if we want to make it sustainable. It is clear that our current economic system is not sustainable. And COVID, if I may talk about that for a second, has actually brought that even more to life. It's a very sad thing that's happening, but it's a good thing if we can capitalize on the learnings of it and actually come out, not coming out better, but constructing something better than what we came into. And it's very clear that the solutions to the current crisis need first and foremost empathy, and the golden rule is a good benchmark for that, but it also needs system thinking and above all collective action. We simply can't do it alone at the level that these challenges are there. We need to really muster our joint shoulders under that. So the most important ingredient for that, I will argue, is actually leadership. We know what we have to do. We've never been so forewarned about what is going to happen. We've never been so forearmed to do something about it. And the, we have the technologies, we have the enough knowledge of what makes it work. What is really the missing ingredient above anything else is human willpower. A few lessons from COVID that we'll build on. The first lesson I think that COVID teaches us is that you can't have healthy people on an unhealthy planet. For the first time, more people now understand the relationships between climate, biodiversity, human health, actually a racial dimension paying disproportionate uh, the price for this crisis, uh, the economy itself, this interrelationship of our society, this wholeness of that we need to address is now better understood. And obviously the statistics are terrible, not only from a health point of view, but I think people are starting to understand right now is that it's not actually a COVID crisis. It's a crisis of us destroying the planet. It's a crisis of us encroaching on nature. We've had pandemics every three, five years. Zika, SARS, Ebola, no COVID. Actually, the black swan is not COVID. It's a particularly nasty one, but it's not the black swan. The black swan is that we continue to destroy modern nature and are incapable to work together to do something around it. You know, the WWF came out and said over the last four decades, 68% of our species in the world have disappeared. If you're from Latin America, that number is 94%. If you look at climate change, it's even worse. Three trillion trees have been cut down. That's half of the world's rainforest that we have. And it's happening at a pace that we've never seen before. Despite the promises that were made in Paris, for example, to restore nature and restore our biodiversity, we have seen a continuous degeneration. Not surprisingly either that we see climate change still, despite COVID, on a trajectory of three degrees plus. Even the decline that we have seen with COVID, which is certainly not recommendable as a solution to attack these issues, is barely enough if we do that every year to stay below one and a half degrees, which requires us to be net zero in emissions by 2050. So no healthy people on an unhealthy planet. The second one is actually a positive one. It's that we are seeing more so now during the crisis, this bifurcation about companies or investment funds that are oriented towards ESG, environmental social governance, are doing better. They're doing better in returns for the financial market, and these companies are doing better. Companies that take care of their employees have less mental stress issues or health. Companies that have better relationships in their value chain are better able to deal with these disruptions that are now happening. Companies that have a better reputation maintain the loyalty of their, uh, of their customer base. ESG, environmental social governance, is the only part of the financial markets that really significantly kept growing even during the crisis. There's now $2 trillion of funds that have gone in over the last few years, and the last quarter, $70 billion alone. And a, uh, a study by Morningstar, which does an analysis of all these funds together, found out actually that 84% of these funds are actually outperforming these older conventional funds. 
So that's a good thing because it gets the interest of the financial market and it also gets the interest of CEOs who obviously want their companies to perform. And what you now see is because we're able to assess risks to all these factors that we were not able to do before, you're getting actually not only a risk avoidance, you're getting lower cost of capital and actually investment in these opportunities that are increasingly apparent. So it moves from risk avoidance and negative selection to actually positive. That's a good sweet spot to be in. The, the third lesson, I think, is really the real black swan, is the inability of governments to work together to do something about it. We have really elected quite a lot of people to office that you have to you know, really question our collective wisdom. We can't blame the people that are in office. We really have to go back to the underlying causes why we have elected them. And that is the, the things, the system changes that we need and the, the things you need to attack. When you see a president you don't like, it's not his fault or her fault. It's the reason that we put them there that we need to look at. But we really have a moment in history that is at an all-time low in global cooperation at a time that the issues of climate change, pandemic, financial markets, cybersecurity are more and more global. It's the worst moment that this all comes together. So we need to fill that point, and I'll talk about it in a minute. And then the last lesson is that fast actions can be taken. Human beings are linear thinkers. They prefer short term, especially if their own survival is at stake. Unfortunately, it doesn't work as well for climate change because that's sort of a longer term issue. It's not an immediate threat to most people. But when you have a threat like COVID, boy, can we take action very fast, individually and collectively. So there's something there to capitalize on. We see the private sector moving faster. We see the public organizing themselves in amazing ways. New partnerships being formed. How can we really leverage that as we design better? What is very clear in all of this is that most people want change. A recent Harris poll in the US, 90% of people feel that capitalism doesn't work anymore. And if you look at any country in the world where polling is being done, most people, the same percentage-wise, want to come out in a better state than they went in. They don't want to come back where we came from. They realize that where we came from wasn't working either. In fact, we forgot that before COVID, we were on a 3% climate change trajectory or more. It would have taken 257 years for women to have gender equality versus men. We saw an income inequality that continued to go up. And frankly, in many countries, the growth wasn't there either. So it wasn't working before. It gave us this crisis. We certainly now need to be sure that we uh, come out better. And the key question, as I will argue in a minute, is do we care? Because we really have to muster our own uh, strong sense of wanting to change that, because it's not going to be easy. We're dealing with festered structures. We're dealing with festered interests. We're dealing with festered order. And most of the changes we have seen in, in the last 15, 20, 25 years, if you want to, have been marginal on the margins, where people actually make incremental changes, more driven by not to lose than to really win. You know, 5 6% here, 5 6% there. Because what we now need is incremental change. And that requires quite a lot of different ways of thinking, it requires you to work on the system, not in the system. If you work in the system, the system will push back and the changes will be incremental. A good example right now in the US, and I don't want to make this a political talk, but there is so much money into politics of the fossil fuel industry, which we know is the old industry, yet they're getting twice the level of subsidies that are coming out than uh, the, the, the future of fossil free or green industry. So the direction is clear. We need to change the current economic model to make it more inclusive, make it more sustainable, and make it more equitable. And that is obviously uh, the task that is set out. People understand now that uh, we have a finite planet and we cannot have this unlimited exploited growth model. It just doesn't work. We have to redefine differently what success looks like. Now, I think we're on the crust of a big revolution, as big as the industrial revolution, and probably with the speed of the technical revolution. We see cost curves changing. We see technologies changing. We see sustainable technology coming in at a rate never seen before. And now we're starting to see the financial market move. You might like or not like the financial market, but ultimately to drive the bigger changes, we need to have them in, uh, on, on, uh, on board. So this is a moment to design the future that we want. And frankly, there's only one option. We can design it if we want to and get a future with slower growth, with more inequality, with more bureaucracy, with more populism or nationalism at the polls or xenophobia, with more rigid borders, or we can create this future 
that is obviously one of productivity, of innovation, of clean air, of restoring our, our uh, natural resources, uh, interconnected, smarter governments. I don't know about you, but I know which one I would prefer. And frankly, the other is not an option. We are moving, we're moving in the right direction, but what is missing is the scale and speed. So we need to focus on the scale and speed, and that requires us to work on the system versus in the system. So we need to do that with a little bit of design. We need to be fair and inclusive when we design this. We need to design this sustainably from an economic, social, and financial point of view, may I say. We need to be sure that whatever we design is resilient, that it can handle future shocks. And last but not least, we certainly want a certain degree of solidarity or interconnectivity when we design this. What are the systems changes that are needed? Very briefly, four. I won't go into that in detail. The first one is move the financial markets to the longer term. If we keep up to, uh, ourselves myopically focused on the short term, it's not going to work. Issues like food security, climate change, inclusion need to be worked with longer term plans. Secondly, we need to decarbonize our global economy. We're carbon junkies, have never done that. Thirdly, we need to move to a circular, or I would argue, regenerative economy. Regenerative is we need to make it better because we've actually destroyed. Us overshoot day was August 22nd this year. We're using already 60% more resources than the world can replenish. We're stealing from the future. So it's regenerative. And then last but not least, it needs to be inclusive. We already started with a world that wasn't very good, where we still had about a billion and a half people living in absolute poverty. We have 1.6 billion people in the workforce not having a social security or safety net. We've seen poverty go up again, 100 million because of, of uh, COVID. 500 million equivalent jobs have been lost. One of the biggest issues that is going to come out of COVID is our ability to generate jobs, especially for young people and women in that who pay a disproportionate the price for all of this. And if we don't find the inclusion, the job creation, we are going to have a big issue of social cohesion. That probably is a bigger challenge, in my opinion, than climate change. So what are the imperatives of the systems changes? First and foremost, we need to put purpose at the core. Why are we here? If I talk about business, because I would argue that if governments don't really function for the next 10, 15 years, it is business, responsible business, that needs to step up to the plate to help drive these changes. They have the funds, the resources, the innovation, a little bit more more interest in working longer term sustainable models. But business needs to put purpose at the core by putting itself to the service of society, by ensuring that these business models are net positive, not less bad, or CSR doesn't work anymore. Net positive is the goal. The second one is we need to change our accounting system. We treasure what we measure. If we only measure financial capital, we'll optimize financial capital till the cows come home. But if we also measure environmental and social capital, we can drive the changes. And in fact, it's starting to happen. We've put groups of people together to drive that systems change. IFRS, GRI, SASB, and many of these accounting standards are now going together. Companies now need to start publishing their climate risk and exposure. How many board members are women and uh, pay scales? These are the first attempts to move to this broader direction. You treasure what you measure. The third thing we need to do is uh, push for a green recovery. We're spending $12 trillion now very uncoordinated, lots of it lost, to stabilize the current economy. My argument is we need to spend another five or 10 trillion to ensure that we create the jobs and come out of this. And that is really our biggest challenge. But whatever we spend, we have to be sure that we spend it on the right things to green the economy. In the financial crisis, we missed that opportunity. We spent the money behind banks to rescue them, but didn't do anything else. Banks were too big to fail, people were too small to matter. Now we have an opportunity to really design it right. And then last but not least, we need to do that with partnership. I, as I said before, I think companies need to be in the driver's seat, but that also requires establishing trust. Working with transparency, working with accountability, taking on these responsibilities that go well beyond scope one and two. Many companies still think they can outsource their value chain and outsource their responsibilities at the same time. That doesn't work anymore. You have to be responsible for your total footprint in society as companies like Facebook and others are now quickly discovering. So what we need above all, I'll just go very quickly, is uh, different forms of partnership. 
And what we're trying to do is imagine, this is not a pitch for imagine, but we believe that if you bring per category the right number of CEOs together across the value chain at critical mass, which for us is 25, 30%, you can create tipping points. We brought the food value chain together and we're looking at regenerative agriculture, making it carbon positive versus negative. It's the only way, by the way, to solve climate change, of changing the way to reward farmers so that they don't stay poor. Most of the farmers are poor monocrop farmers. We brought the fashion industry together, 68 companies, 30% of the fashion industry. Together, they can move to regenerative cotton. Together, they can solve the single-use plastic issues that alone these companies really cannot do. So our premise is bring enough of them together at the CEO level, drive to these tipping points, then you'll see uh, others coming in, civil society. You'll see also governments willing to move because you've helped them de-risk the process. Ultimately, what is needed is leadership, individually and, and uh, collectively. In fact, an Iranian poet said in the 13th century, yesterday I was clever, so I thought I could change the world. Today I'm wise, I'm going to change myself. So the change actually starts with yourself, and you need to have the right number of leaders. What are the right leaders? The right leaders are purpose-driven, are leaders that understand that they can work in partnership, that think intergenerational, above all, leaders that put the interest of others ahead of their own, knowing that by doing so, they're better off themselves as well. They're courageous leaders. We've lost this humanity in business and leadership. Courageous comes from the French word cur, which is hard. So these people will lead with the heart and the brain. And they have a high level of awareness of what is going on in the world and a high appetite for engagement to do something about it. It happens to be that if you look study after study, that our female race, if I may call it that way, possesses more of these capabilities than the male race. For very good reasons, I can explain at different times. That's why it's also not surprising that the countries that are currently run by women, Iceland, Norway, uh, Finland, Denmark, New Zealand, she just got re-elected yesterday. All these countries have been able to handle COVID significantly better than the machos who've turned this into a political thing. At the end of the day, it is human willpower. At the end of the day, it's a simple question, do we care? And the only mustering of energy for us to care is to put again that, that inner purpose, our own uh, engine of energy, if you want to, of who we are, who we want to be at the core of it. The Dalai Lama said it very well when he said that if you seek enlightenment for yourself, simply to enhance yourself and your position, you miss purpose. But if you seek enlightenment um, to help others uh, achieve their uh, missions, you have a life with purpose. So the most important thing in all of this is be the leadership that leads a life with purpose. Thank you very much and good luck to Vittorio. Thank you very much, Mr. Polman, for your insightful perspective on responsible leadership. It has been an honor having you at the 2020 Nova Virtual Conference. Following your inspiring speech, we are even further convinced of the importance of responsible leadership, not only for us as individuals, but also as a society. I will now leave the stage to the chairman and president of NOVA, Tommaso Stefani and Francesco Tronci, and the co-founders of Mentors for You, Stefania Boroli and Dimitri Sivedis, who will explain the new initiatives of the association. Good afternoon, everybody, and good morning to those of you who are connected for the States. Welcome to the 20th NOVA conference. We're glad to announce the launch of Fondazione NOVA today. It's by joining forces with Mentors for You, the largest uh, European mentoring program with Fondazione Nova, I have the ambition of uh, making an impact and being uh, a pillar of the educational infrastructure, education and professional infrastructure in our country. We are building a net strong community, a network uh, uh, of 5,000 students, executives and professors willing to exchange experiences, knowledge, and committed to promote the value of competence, innovation, and meritocracy. First of all, thank you from the bottom of my heart to all those who actually, all the people who make uh, this conference possible. I assisted to the most incredible digital-based teamwork of students, alumni, professors, and managers from all around the world. And uh, this is the DNA of Fondazione Nova. Uh, and this conference, I think, is nothing uh, we can uh, compare to what we can do if we keep on working together as an active and engaged community. Today is not only 20 years since the birth of NOVA. Today is also 35 years since the recognition of the Nobel Prize in Economic Sciences to Professor Franco Modigliani. Franco was the first and only Italian, so far at least, to get this award. Modigliani inspired and supported us when we founded NOVA 20 years ago. 
There's another economic professor, a friend of Nova, who I want to remember today. I'm talking about Alberto Lesina, who sadly left us last May. To Modigliani and Lesina, let me say thank you for your spirit, your inspiration, your guidance. We will never forget you. Modigliani and Lesina are two champions of the strategic role of competence. This is a cornerstone of our association, and it's at the heart of the value proposition of Fondazione Nova. We will promote the importance of facts and knowledge-based decision-making in our country in a period during which it seems that competence lost, in a way, is strategic value. Luigi Einaudi, another Italian economist and first president of the Republic, was gifted by the ability to explain complex matters with simple words. And uh, endlessly repeated the motto, knowledge must, must come before deliberation. But knowledge together with innovation and social responsibility are useless if there is no meritocracy. So we need to keep working because I want to remember that we were the first. I think that when we started talking about meritocracy 20 years ago, nobody was talking about it. Actually, I think that we gave our contribution to put it in the middle of the debate, also on Corriere della Sera and so on. So uh, we need to keep working on designing a system that enables the best idea to come out and uh, to be in, in the talents to be in the right positions to express them. 20 years ago, we were convinced that the competitiveness of companies and countries was ultimately a war for talent. It's still like that, but we need now to move forward if you want to address the most complex challenges we have in front of us. The combined effect of um, an aging population uh, together with a fast-growing debt is putting the highest pressure on, on new generation. We'll be responsible at the end of the day to pay back for this debt. Mario Draghi, a long-term friend of Nova, said recently that the best way to find a direction of the present is to design the future. And he said that while encouraging, of course, the government and Italy to invest more on new generation and on education. So, and I'm getting close to the conclusions. With Fondazione Nova, we will give our contribution to help new generation to be more competent, to provide them with uh, the opportunity to succeed, and to allocate the talents where they can express the best of their potential and generate innovation. If so far we encourage students and talents to study abroad and come back afterwards, now our mission should get larger and work to create the condition to make these talents create value here in our country. We will do our part in connecting managers with students, building bridges between university and businesses, connecting the United States with Italy and uh, the international uh, university with Italy, and we'll try to improve the match between demand and offer of competence. And I'm convinced that uh, by doing so, we can also transform Italy in an attractive place for the best students, teachers, managers, who can come here not only for the beauty of our land, they know already that it's beautiful, and they come already here as tourists, but they can want to come here also because they can find a stimulating and fulfilling environment to study, work, and live. My time is over, and uh, so let me close as usual, as we always close uh, the conferences in, in the past 20 years with uh, our say, Viva Nova, Viva l'Italia. Thank you very much. I give the floor to Francesco Tronci, who will uh, give you even more details about uh, our conference. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tommaso. It's great to be here with you and the rest of our community. And as you said, Nova's history started 20 years ago in the top US business schools. And our members now include 2,000 alumni in the 28 to 55 age group. We actually go from MBA students, such as the ones who organized today's event, all the way up to the CEOs of major international corporations. And they now come from both top US and European business schools. They're present in management roles in many of the largest enterprises and are active in several worthy causes and institutions. Even the Mentors for You community was founded by Nova alumni, and they've successfully engaged thousands of talented students and professionals in the 21 to 40 age group, with a new program also focused on high schools. So combined, NOVA and Mentors for You uh, span over three, let's say four decades of seniority, making it a unique ecosystem for talented individuals to be connected and grow together, as well as give back to the rest of the community and beyond. And just as today's speakers that we heard from Paul Polman, we'll hear from Dorio Colau and so many others later on, just as they have focused on responsible leadership and give back, many others in our community and who are watching us today want to do the same. 
And of course, we cannot solve everything, but if we focus our collective efforts on specific areas, such as education and talent management in this case, we can go a long way. So together with our alma maters, with our fellow alumni, and with our corporate partners that will support us along the way, we can make an impact, and we should. So the new uh, foundation wants to become a platform for all those alumni and everyone else watching us today, friends of NOVA, to get involved and support worthy causes. Uh, such as, for example, supporting talents through mentorship, recruiting, financial support, but also promoting higher education, meritocracy, social mobility, and managerialization. We want to continue to create a strong, highly valuable network of successful executives, entrepreneurs, professionals, and students, all united by a strong desire to grow and give back. And with all our energies combined, the foundation can become a stakeholder in positively impacting the Italian business community and the educational infrastructure, acting to support all talents across different age groups to achieve their maximum potential and bridging any gaps between the business and the education systems. So our core three pillars will be higher education, mentoring, and active engagement. So we'll be engaging MEA alumni and other highly qualified professionals in mentoring talents and giving back. We'll encourage participation to MBA programs and higher education programs in general. And we'll provide a platform for executives and corporations to give back, promoting the creation of contents and events tailored to this community. Finally, let me say that I would like to thank all the students, professionals, and many volunteers who made today's event possible. It's been a pleasure to work with all of you during the past year, and I look forward to the next years. We've been supported by several partners. I'm very thankful and excited about the next steps and to work with all of you on this. And with all of that said, let me now hand over to Dimi, one of the co-founders of Mentors for You. Thank you, Francesco, and good afternoon to everybody. Let me help you bring to life what Fondazione Nova wants to be by sharing with you some of the activities that we want to bring to life uh, together with the management team and the volunteers. For example, conferences and webinars, such as the one of today, where we bring the very best speakers to educate and inspire all the participants. Scholar mentorship for high school and uh, university students to help them make the best career and professional decisions to unlock at best their talents. Networking events to connect talents across all age groups to help flourishing and the creation of ideas and to support the generation of opportunities and ventures. Think tank papers to support public decision making in important matters such as education, business, and entrepreneurship because you want to help and support innovation and growth. Scholarships because financial resources never have to be a constraint for those who deserve, work hard, and believe and many other activities with one overarching goal. We want to be a truly special place where every hardworking, ambitious, and talented Italian can find inspiration, mentoring, and resources to make dreams come true. Fondazione Nova is the foundation of all of us, so we will be as successful as the engagement of all the members of the community. So we need you, as my dear friend and co-founder Stefania will tell you more about it. Yes, thank you, Divi, and uh, uh, good afternoon to all. So the mission of Fondazione Nova that Tommaso, Francesco, and Dimi just explained is exactly the spirit that originated both Nova and Mentors for You. We launched uh, Mentors for You as a result of a call to action after the 12th Nova conference that we organized in Boston back in 2012, uh, whose title was Wake Up Italy. That were difficult times for our country, and we managed to mobilize hundreds of young professionals and top executives willing to do that. Exceptional people who knew how much their effort, their time, and their experience would have been helpful to younger students approaching for the first time the employment arena. Now, in uh, even more difficult times for the old world, we want to double down and be even more ambitious. We want to expand this network of exceptional people willing to leave a mark on the future of our country. We want to give uh, to everybody who might be willing to give back a platform to do so by sharing their confidence, their experience, their network, and to help make Italy a better place uh, to develop new talents and to nurture the leadership of the future. 
So I'm overexcited uh, for the time I had with the Fondazione Nova, and I can't wait uh, to hear all of your ideas on how to contribute to our mission and how to make an impact on the competitiveness uh, of our country in the world. And now, I believe I have the privilege uh, to introduce you uh, the next uh, guest speaker of our conference, uh, Mr. Vittorio Colau. Unfortunately, Mr. Colau was not able to attend live uh, this event uh, due to last minute uh, logistical problems, but we're very grateful that he was able to send us a video contribution that we will share with you in a minute. Vittorio Colau is the Vice Chairman Europe uh, at General Atlantic, and non-executive director of Unilever and Verizon Communications. Vittorio has been the CEO of uh, Vodafone Group from 2008 to 2018, and he has also been uh, the group CEO of RCS Media Group in Italy between 2004 and 2006. He is today an advisor and board member of multiple charities and education institutions, including uh, Bocconi University Milan, Oxford Market in the UK, Comet and Como, and Humanitas Politecnico in Milan. Um, we all remember that he was also the leader of the task force for the Italian response to the COVID emergency. So please uh, welcome Mr. Vittorio Colau. Vittorio, it's a pleasure to have you with us at the 20th NOVA conference. Okay. Thank you for being here. As you know, the focus of this edition is the role that responsible leaders have on broader society in, modern, in moments of unprecedented change. Given your experience, we feel especially privileged to have you here. In the intro, my colleague provided just a glimpse on your career, but there is so much more to say. We would like to start our conversation from the key turning points in your career, from your MBA at our business school in 1990, to your role leading the Italian COVID task force in 2020. Would you mind giving us your perspective? No, first of all, thanks a lot. It's a pleasure to be with you today, even if, of course, it's only via video. I'm not sure I want to talk about the uh, turning points. You know, each of us have a turning point, which sometimes it's personal, sometimes it's, uh, it's professional. I would talk a little bit about, uh, I would say my career almost like in the three phases, the phase uh, of learning, the phase of doing, and then the phase of uh, contributing, which is uh, where I'm now. Because I think it's a it's 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 an interesting way of looking at things, which is not career steps, but more uh, you know what has shaped uh, the phase. The first phase was the phase of learning. Uh, you mentioned Harvard Business School. I would put in this phase three things. I would put in this phase the military, believe it or not, uh, where I really I think I got this concept of leading from the front and being uh, always with the troops, with the people that work with you and never kind of uh, being a distant leader. Then Harvard Business School, as you mentioned correctly, uh, HBS and MBA in, in general was, if you want, the joy of assessing problems and situations together with others and, and the power of the team of a bright, intelligent, smart team. And then McKinsey, uh, which was quite frankly, the period of data, facts, analysis. And you put the three together it gives already a little bit my concept of what is uh, a leadership model. A leadership model is about uh, having facts, having the analytics, but also leveraging other people and having you know, the power of collective uh, brain together and then leading from the front and uh, uh, giving the example. And that was first phase, more or less uh, finishing in the mid 90s. Then I had the kind of the era of doing and again, three experiences here. Uh, the, the startup of what today is Vodafone Italy that used to be Omnitel. And here, I would say the exciting thing was entrepreneurialism and doing and making things happen. Also, I was very young. You know, you're in the mid-30s. Mid you are in the moment where you have the maximum energy. And, and making things happen, creating something that didn't exist before was very important for me. Then uh, I left for a couple of years. I ran a media company there. It was more the, the, the power of uh, shaping uh, everybody else's uh, information base and, and, and opinion and how you can really contribute to the formation of uh, uh, social and political consensus. And then the amazing adventure of Vodafone Group, where I had you know, to put together the group, rationalize, create the culture, the pleasure of multiculturalism, uh, and, uh, and really the love for the world. It's the, it's the phase where I really love the world. And so this was more a phase of doing and the phase of taking responsibility and 
feeling on you the the weight of responsibility but i also have to say feeling the joy of seeing things happen something that didn't exist before and suddenly exists or or, or a culture a, a way of working that suddenly becomes the norm because uh, because you have got the impact and now the third phase is the current one where there is more kind of uh, a variety of experiences and trying to help others in a way have the same joys and same responsibilities they have got. Uh, and here, what I'm finding out is that you can do it in a variety of ways. So I'm on the board of Unilever, which is a fantastic company. And again, uh, you know, uh, they're uh, helping as a board uh, management team to succeed and to make, uh, to make their strategy uh, succeed and also do well to the world or Verizon, which is the same thing. But also, I'm working with uh, uh, General Atlantic, which is growth capital, and again, helping young or younger entrepreneurs making their dream happen and providing at the same time wisdom and, uh, uh, and sometimes also warning, because sometimes you know, there are also mistakes uh, that uh, can be made in order to allow others to follow the same thing, which is a little bit, I think, uh, the, the, the real peak of leadership, which is when you accept that others will have the responsibility, but you really want to help them and steer. And in this context, I had also the Italian task force uh, kind of assignment where uh, I got a call one day from the prime minister. I was walking in the garden in front of my house during the lockdown. And he said, hey, Mr. Colau, I don't know you, but they say good things about you. Will you come and help? And, and it's one of those things that you decide in two hours and you say, you know what, uh, it's a bit of duty, a bit the kind of pleasure of being cold, but also the kind of challenge of doing something which is completely undefined, because what does it mean to be the chairman of a task force in the middle of a crisis? And again, it's the pleasure to contribute in this case to your country and uh, to hopefully, uh, you know, the, 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 the solution to this problem with your experience, with your energy, with your passion and so on. So I would say learning, doing, contributing uh, have been uh, uh, the big three uh, chapters of my life. Thank you very much, Vittorio. And your answer leads us to our second question. What does responsible leadership mean to you? Has your view changed over time? That's a very, it's a very good question because there's a lot of discussion about, uh, uh, you know, responsible leaders and uh, the position of the U.S. business roundtable, American capitalism versus European capitalism, and in general, what should the leader uh, really do? If I'm honest, you know, my uh, my my view has never changed. So I have to say honestly, I never changed. I thought what I thought before, and I still keep thinking the same. And it's a balanced view. So I thought uh, that certain, you know, excesses that were defining the role of leadership very narrow, like, you know, you are a leader, you have to uh, maximize shareholder uh, return, and that's what you have to do, uh, was too narrow. I, I always thought that uh, your role is to make sure that uh, whatever organization you work in, whether it's for profit or for non-profit, it doesn't really change too much. It's really to do what is right for the long term of your customers or the people who you know you interact with, your uh, uh, employees, the people around you, the citizens, and uh, and your suppliers. In the end, you know, if you have the four communities around you, see the value of what you do. Uh, in the long term, you know you're leading well, and uh, you know uh, you can also make the point that for a business, which is probably what interests most of the people who listen to this video, uh, a successful business is, all, uh, is also very important because if you're not successful financially, you cannot invest. If you're not successful financially, you cannot innovate. If you're not successful financially, you will end up having to fire people. If you're not successful financially, you don't pay taxes, which by the way, will be very important in the future. So I am a little bit skeptical when I hear people to say, oh, capitalism, I used to hear people saying, oh, capitalism and leadership is about maximizing one dimension. And I'm also skeptical today when I hear, oh, forget completely, uh, this has completely changed. The reality is that at the end of the day, you know, a leader needs, is a person who thinks about what is good and right for the long term and, uh, and, uh, and applies uh, not just ethics. I know you guys in business schools now study a lot ethics. 
I, again, I'm a bit critical sometimes of that ethical thing because it's very easy to write on a wall five principles and then be a complete bad person or bad company. I think there must be also morality a little bit. So it's not just ethics. Ethics is about what is legal, what is permitted, and what is tolerable in a society. I think you also have to go to the moral side of things, what is right, what is really desirable for the human uh, beings that are uh, connected. And if you follow that thing of saying, you know, do what is right, do what is right for the long term, don't take short termism as, uh, as an excuse. You know, most of the times, uh, if you have skills, which of course you guys are now learning, uh, you do the right thing and you are a responsible leader. And a CEO of Vodafone and RHS, operating in the essential and sensitive telco and media sectors, how did you balance the interests of your company with that of broader society? Listen, uh, it's a good question because it follows the, the previous point. And, uh, and you, you, if you're listening to this video, you might be thinking, oh, okay, Vittorio has given the classic good response. You know, think about the long term, be good to humans, and, and it's easy. And the reality is that the problem emerges when you have a practical decision to make. And um, I think, uh, I mean, if I look at my kind of, you know, whether it was an important decision or a stupid decision, uh, plenty of times you have things which are, uh, you know, in, in media, for example, I was publisher. I was a publisher. Is it right to publish gossip magazines? At what level gossip becomes corrosive of the society? In, uh, uh, in telecommunications, what do you do with uh, legal interception and privacy and security? How do you balance the need to protect the society from terrorism, but also the need to protect the citizens from a dictator or a bad government that want to use technology to, uh, to, to, to enforce uh, a, a bad regime. Is it right to move uh, your operations to, for example, Ireland uh, to reduce VAT, which at some point I had to, to look at because in Vodafone we could have done a certain setup in Ireland for our prepaid uh, uh, business that would have saved uh, uh, BAT. At what level, uh, at what level uh, you push products or services, I don't know, in Africa or in India, which have zero market, but they are very good for women or very good for you know, people who have low literacy and can help. So is it good for shareholders? It's not good for shareholders because you lose money, but it's good for the society where you work. So, and I always, thought that at the end of the day, uh, th th there's like uh, the way you solve uh, uh, these things is always two things. One, what would, uh, what would the customers think about your decision? Think about your customers. W would my customers kind of like the idea that, uh, again, in my example, I, I, I don't cooperate with the authorities to protect uh, uh, the society from terrorism? And would they like the idea that I do it in such a way that also tries to protect a bit their privacy on how much and what's the balance? And the same thing for, you know, the, you know, tax matters, you know, um, is it right to pretend that you operate out of a country when you're not? Uh, and, and what would customers think? And so in the end, um, it's something that I, I always go, goes back to, how would you feel about your decision and the thinking behind your decision, not just the decision, would be is exposed to public scrutiny from the people you care most about, which are your customers, your employees. And if you follow this thing and you allow in the company a lot of discussion with all the angles being debated and you don't stop the discussion and you have you know, dissident voices saying, hey, I don't think this is right or hey, I think this, I remember when mobile phones came and pictures were coming, it was very easy to see a wonderful business in exchanging, you know, uh, funny pictures, but we didn't have the tools of today. So immediately, you know, it went into pornographic stuff and we stopped it. So we said, we don't have the tools to stop it. Now, today it's possible, but, you know, in the early, uh, you know, in the early phase of, of 3G, it was not possible. So we decided not to open the, others decided to open the business. We decided not to do it and, we realized that we had to police the system to make sure it wouldn't happen. So debate internally, uh, listen to many 
business voices, but also non-business voices. Talk to other corners of the society to really understand the implication of what you're doing. And eventually, you know, go back to, uh, you know, your morality and not just the ethics. Uh, and, uh, and I have to say, I'm not sure I got everything right, but most of the times when we took decisions which were unclear or borderline, I found that the support from the people, from the customers, from those who really understand why you have done it and you explain it has been fantastic. Thank you. You briefly touched on your role in the COVID task force. And our next question is exactly on this topic. The COVID task force was comprised of exceptional people working in exceptional circumstances. They had very different backgrounds, work remotely, and were under extreme scrutiny and pressure. All this while being in close connection with the government. What did this experience teach you from a leadership point of view? So it's, uh, I never really made comments about that period uh, publicly. So this is the first time, and I hope this will be taken in the right way. Uh, I think it has been incredible because you had, first we were 15, then we became 20. Uh, 20 people who have never met before with the exception of one. So I knew one person before. The others were unknown faces to me, and I was you know, unknown to them. Um, very, very different backgrounds. So you go from people who are consultants. So I could imagine that the you know head of BCG was would have been very similar to me, or bankers, uh, or lawyers. But others were professors of psychology, professors of uh, psychiatry, psycho uh, sociologists, uh, expert of the environment. Uh, there was professors of any kind. So literally every every domain represented very different with very different way of working and uh, also thinking, which is, uh, we are, that, that's the thing we are less used to in, uh, in business. We tend to have, we call diversity what is not really diverse. There's a, a little bit of difference in background, but not much. And here, this was really different. And to be honest, uh, uh, it has worked well because I don't want to say good things about myself, but I really allowed everybody to kind of go in the direction that they thought they were good at, not completely identifying, you know, sub leaders for the different groups, but I didn't pretend to control myself, for example, the more social elements of our recommendations, because I said, listen, guys, I'm not a social expert. I know nothing about certain things, but, you know, I'm more on industrial policy. I'm more on uh, uh, how to control the medical aspects. We said there's a scientific committee, scientific committee. We will never even question a word of that. However, the implication on unlocking the country and reopening the country, that will be ours. And so uh, if you want, the lesson is that uh, if you have a little bit of orchestration, you need to have some orchestration because otherwise, you know, 20 people never uh, uh, would never work together. And you communicate how important it is to have uh, a product for each deadline. And we had very, very tight deadlines, as you can imagine. I mean, I remember the first, uh, so we were, the, com the co committee was officially appointed by decree on a Friday. On Saturday, the prime minister called this first video conference and he said, OK, I want to have the criteria on how to unlock all the industrial sectors and service sectors in Italy and what kind of safeguards this is and that. And then I said, OK, three weeks. And the guy goes, no, 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 seven days. You have seven days to do it. And eventually we did it in 10 or, or, or 11. But, you know, when you're in that situation, allowing people to say, OK, you go on what you're really very good. And you have to be sure that somebody will make mistakes. But at the end of the day, the advantage of what they really bring in terms of pluses will be so big that they will realize themselves what is not really relevant. And eventually, over time, they will accept the opinion of the others in, in terms of converging towards one solution. And so what I learned is good people have to be unleashed, and uh, even if they're very different, and you have to force them to take back uh, you know, uh, the things that don't work from a team perspective, uh, rather than trying to orchestrate everything yourself, because I, I would have been crazy. Having said that, a little bit of orchestration is always needed. Otherwise, don't deliver on a short uh, on a short deadline. But I have to say, I really appreciated the diversity and the ability of very intelligent, very diverse people to contribute what they're really expert of and, you know, withhold the rest. So as you know, the Innova Association aims to leverage the talents of people 
in business to support society. What are the key challenges and opportunities ahead for our country and how can people from our community contribute? I would say the challenges coming from COVID are more or less the same everywhere, right? So it's a clearly, uh, first of all, the, the safety of people and then, and then uh, economic recovery and then uh, how to uh, absorb the costs of, uh, of the economic recovery. And so these challenges are the same. I would say in Italy, we have a couple of, uh, I would, we, we have a situation which is marginally more, di more difficult. Uh, it's more difficult because we have more debt. And it's more difficult because we have an aging population. And more that aging population creates a big risk of uh, intergenerational injustice, i.e. using resources in ways which are not good for your generation or for the generation after you, and, and actually protect essentially our generation and, uh, and the older part of the country, but not really build uh, uh, for the future. And, and that's a Big risk. I don't think it's a small risk, to be honest. In our work for the prime minister, we have put everything in a medium term uh, context uh, and we have recommended, I mean, at the end of the day, we have recommended things which are more or less the same of every other country. So infrastructure, digital environment, social justice. Uh, but, you know, in a country which has a lot of debt and uh, an aging population, the risk is that you drift away. And, uh, and, and for example, one thing that in Italy is very discussed now is this big role of the state and, and the fact that the state should intervene in everything. I think the state should intervene, and I'm not against, in principle, state intervention. But you have to be careful that this does not become, uh, uh, you know, duping uh, the country and, and essentially taking away all incentives to, uh, to really build a country which is good for 50 years, not for the next, uh, for the next five. And so I think uh, uh, people in your organization that tend to be young and tend to have an interest in the long term should really be a little bit more vocal about uh, the long-term orientation of uh, the recovery actions. Uh, Europe has called the plans Next Generation EU. I think it's a great it's a great name because it indicates exactly how we should try to come out of this crisis. I think the youth should speak up more. I'm a bit surprised why in certain countries, especially in Italy, the youth seems to be, young people seem to be a little bit silent on, uh, on this topic. Uh, spend more in education, spend more in uh, really good infrastructure. It does not mean only physical infrastructure, also social infrastructure, but the good one, the one that is resilient for the long term, the one that can help uh, for example, support uh, uh, young children, have more children. The, young, the one that would allow people who are excluded to come back into the workforce, the one that allows people that are not digital, uh, digitally literate to come back instead of talking only about subsidies. And there is this terrible name that has been invented, uh, Subsidistan. We need to be careful that uh, uh, Italy does not become uh, the land of subsidy and not the land of investment. So your generation should speak up more on how to turn money into good investments and not subsidies and investment for the future, which does not mean only economic investment, also social investment. Vittorio, thank you very much for sharing your wisdom with us today. It was very enriching. Thanks again. Thank you and uh, God bless you and uh, best of luck on your lives first and then your careers. Good afternoon to all. It was very interesting and inspirational to hear the perspective of Mr. Vittorio Colau on responsible leadership. I can only acknowledge his tremendous contribution and the great food for thoughts he provided us today. Now let's move to the next section of the NOVA 2020 virtual conference, lighting up the future, the new frontier of energy. Please join me to virtually welcome Professor Dante Roscini from Harvard Business School. Professor Roscini is part of the Business, Government, and International Economy Unit at HBS and is a member of the board of the advisory board of several public and private companies and financial institutions. Before joining HBS, he spent 20 years in senior position at three of the largest U.S. investment banks in New York and London. Today, Professor Roscini will lead a speaker series on the complex topics of energy transition and how companies and their leaders are shaping the future of the industry embracing a long-term vision. Mr. Francesco Venturini, CEO of NLX, Mr. Tony Volpe, CEO of Farp Renewables, and Mr. Marco Alvera, CEO of SNAM, will join Professor Roscini and discuss with him these crucial issues. Now, without any further ado, let me pass it over to Professor Roscini.
Welcome, Professor. The stage is all yours. Thank you very much, Ascanio, and uh, good morning or good afternoon to everybody who is uh, listening. It's a pleasure to be here um, and uh, to, to lead these uh, this, this three discussions we're going to have on, on the energy industry. Energy, of course, is, is central to everything we do. Uh, on a personal note, energy is my first love. Uh, I am a nuclear engineer. Uh, I worked in Italy and the U.S. Uh, uh, before coming to Harvard Business School, which put me on a different course altogether, but it's still in my heart. Um, energy is an industry which is sometimes viewed as a bit of a state and traditional industry. Uh, but in fact, it's in the midst of a deep and uh, dynamic, uh, obviously, transformation, a transformation which is due to, I guess, to, to, to several elements, which is the advances in technologies in everywhere, the search for efficiency, and of course, uh, societal pressures in the age of sustainability. The, the three D uh, trends of decarbonization, decentralization, and digitization are completely changing the industry. And the new focus is on renewables, uh, the Internet of Energy, as it's called, the new storage solutions, uh, distributed energy resources, the move to electric vehicles, and of course, uh, artificial intelligence. So it is an exciting space, and Italy has been able to produce a number of uh, very innovative uh, uh, world-class uh, uh, companies uh, in the sector. And uh, we are quite lucky to have, of course, the CEOs of three of such companies with us today. So without further ado, let me uh, introduce our first uh, panelist, our first guest, Francesco Venturini. Francesco, I can see you on uh, the screen. Hello. So that's good news. Hello. I hope that you can hear me too. We can hear you perfectly well. Thank you, Francesco. Um, let me just say a couple of words about Francesco because we've, we've known each other for a while. Uh, uh, Francesco is the CEO of NLX. Anything with an X means that it's future, of course. And um, uh, he is, uh, this is the global division of uh, uh, NL, of the NL Group, which provides uh, new digitalized products and value-added services such as uh, energy efficiency, demand response, electric mobility, uh, Internet of Things. Um, Francesco has been in the NL for over 20 years, I'm afraid to say, uh, including, of course, his time in uh, Boston, uh, where he was the CEO of NL Green Power. So it's wonderful to see you again, and let me welcome you virtually back to Boston, if I may. Thank um, you. So it's great to have you. We have about uh, um, you know, 15 minutes or so, uh, but uh, enough, hopefully, to, for you to tell us some important things. Um, and, and what I wanted to start with, really, is this whole concept of energy transition, Francesco, because uh, this is probably a trend that we will see for the next 50 years or so. And, uh, and so I wanted to get your views on that. And, uh, and in particular, you know, how private company in this uh, space, you know, transform itself into a sustainable model in this, uh, in this transformation. Uh, you're doing some very interesting things. Uh, please, uh, I'll, I'll let you uh, just uh, illustrate. Thank you. Okay, first, uh, uh, first of all, probably I need to explain a little bit uh, what NLX is. So NLX uh, is um, everything but uh, the usual core business of a utility. So we don't generate, uh, we don't uh, distribute, we don't sell energy, uh, but we do everything else. Uh, three years ago, uh, when uh, NLX was created, there was a big bucket where we put inside all the different pilot projects that we had around the world with an uh, with an L. I mean, as you can imagine, uh, the NL Group had tons of new stuff uh, going on, and we needed to figure out what uh, what to do with it. Honestly speaking, I mean, was it something we could uh, uh, rely on uh, to build uh, a business, uh, build business models that uh, uh, were enough uh, for uh, designing, drawing the future of NL. So the, the past three years have been uh, focusing on trying to figure out what the next step was. And um, I think that uh, what we came up with uh, was the uh, following uh, uh, vision. Uh, so NLX is supposed to uh, help uh, uh, its customers uh, to reduce the cost of energy, to uh, reduce the uh, CO2 footprint, uh, essentially in two ways. One, electrifying consumption. Two, uh, using uh, digital tools. So this is the core of NLX, which is uh, probably um, more, uh, it's closer to uh, what the utility usually does. But then we have a, a second uh, uh, target. And the second target is uh, we need to figure out what to do with the humongous assets that NL has in different ways, not strictly related to the energy sector. And so here uh, you see, for example, the fact that uh, we are launching NLX Pay uh, next week. 
the whole concept is try to avoid to repeat the mistakes that the telecom industry has made uh, uh, 20 years ago, where they focus so much uh, on the commodity of data and not on the, on the content. Well, we believe that uh, there is uh, also going to be the same kind of uh, evolution in, the, uh, in our industry. So there's going to be the commodity, which is obviously the energy, but then we need to build services around it. Uh, and uh, they don't need to be completely related to the core business. They can be something else. We need to create content. And that's what NLX does. So to create content, can you elaborate on that a little bit more? Because I, I can understand a telecom company creating content and adding value services easily. Uh, how can an energy company do the same? Maybe you can tell us a little bit more about that. Well, I, I went back, I went back uh, you know, when, when 20, 20 years ago, uh, telecom companies uh, were just providing uh, uh, voice services, and then they, they, they needed to build something around it. Uh, honestly speaking, nobody knew exactly what content was going to be, obviously. Uh, so there was tons of data, but... Uh, the data were not, uh, I mean, even if you think about it, I mean, the technology was not ready to play movies on TV. So it was, it was a very long journey uh, to get where we are today. Um, and I think that we're uh, substantially doing exactly the same thing in our sector. So when you look at NX Pay, um, the, the concept behind it is not that much uh, uh, of competing with banks. Uh, it's try to create an environment where uh, our customers, uh, I mean, using digital tools, uh, are going to be NL customers, and the commodity is just going to be one piece of the equation. So just give you an example. Let's assume that tomorrow, every time that you go and use the NLX Pay card, you can get points that then at the end are equal to kilowatt hours. Well, the more you spend, the more kilowatt hours uh, you're going to you're gonna gain. So at the end, uh, I mean, conceptually, if you move your consumption customs, your, your way of doing uh, uh, your things, uh, but you move it into the general environment, uh, you can almost get uh, energy for free. And that's the concept uh, of content uh, that we're working on right now. So that's fascinating. It's a concept of VAS, of uh, value-added services, of course, that the telecom industry, as you mentioned, uh, uh, tackled some, some 20 years ago and then technology allowed them to add more and more services and, of course, work with other parties such as banks or financial institutions, etc. Uh, is that the direction that you're, you're talking about here? How, um, how peripheral versus how central is your mission at NLX uh, versus the mission, if you want, of the, of the main uh, you know, electric producer? And also, what references do, do we have in the world of, of successful ventures in that respect from power companies maybe you can tell us about that well i mean first of all if, if you look at the uh, projections uh, of um, all the consulting companies that are studying our sectors um they um, there is there is a very uh, well done study about uh, how the value add the services I, I i don't like this buzzword because i mean uh, it, it, it kind of uh, uh, take you take, it takes you back to the telecom world and it was not very successful so we need to figure out a, a new way of defining these kind of services but if you look at these studies i mean they're showing that uh, uh, especially for the uh, european utilities that usually are more advanced in this kind of uh, evolution um, uh, right now if you look at the pnl uh, around 70, 80% of the p of this company is made uh, of uh, reselling the commodity and 20% is additional services. Well, the forecast is that in the next 10 years, uh, the uh, proportion is going to be fully inverted. So it's going to be 20% the value of commodity, 80% the value of services. Now, obviously, all these studies don't... Uh, don't, uh, don't know what kind of services uh, are going to be implemented, how the utilities are going to be good at doing that. But they start from a different uh, concept, that the value of energy is going to be less and less because of the fact that renewables are going to make energy cheaper and cheaper in the future. So either utilities transform themselves in the relationship with the customers, or potentially they're going to be in trouble. I understand. Thank you. That's obviously the technology change here is obviously uh, central to to your uh, to your change. Uh, are you uh, investing a lot in that respect? Is your R and D um, uh, therefore larger on some of these areas? It is actually for the first time. Uh, um, NL as a utility is um, building its own products. Uh, utilities usually are system integrators. They don't like to build equipment. 
But uh, we had to go out uh, and invest in, uh, in R&D, for example, for uh, uh, our charging stations. Uh, there was no uh, deep kind of product that we wanted. Uh, you, you mentioned the um, uh, IoT platforms uh, at the beginning of this conversation. We, we wanted all our uh, um, charging stations to be fully connected uh, and, and centrally controlled. And to do that, we had to develop uh, our own technology. So yes, we spent uh, money in R&D to develop that technology. And the other thing that we are very much investing in uh, is to build our own uh, software factory, which, um, as you can imagine, uh, um, is extremely difficult, especially when uh, you are a utility in, in Europe. Uh, and there is uh, such a big lack uh, of uh, talent uh, in that sector in this continent today compared with uh, the United States where you live. Well, since we're on that, and we only have a few minutes left, unfortunately, for our chat, um, and since we're talking about you, you brought up talent, which I think is a wonderful uh, segue, uh, do you have any words of wisdom for, in particular, the young audience that we have uh, with us today uh, about their future, about the industry? Should they consider this industry as a potential uh, career outlet for themselves? Um, any words I, I think, uh, I mean, uh, uh, the reason why I spent 20 years with, uh, with this company within this industry is because when I started the first five years, I remember when we used to build the budget, it was just, you know, taking the inflation and, and drawing a straight line. Um, now it's a completely different uh, scenario. I mean, it's, uh, it's, it's, an, it's an industry where there is tons of innovation, where there is uh, uh, tons of creativity, tons of investments, uh, because the... Uh, the, uh, the, 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 the whole uh, um, vision today is that uh, to reduce the CO2 footprint in the world, you need to electrify. So electrification is going to be a, a very important uh, key to reach that goal. Um, my suggestion to the MBA is, is that um, I think that uh, all of us who went to school and studied the uh, that took a master of business administration, unfortunately, now need to um, re rethink uh, um, the, the way we look at it. I, I think that uh, uh, the MBAs need to transform themselves in uh, MBDAs and uh, masters in business and digital administration because it's so much key of uh, uh, anything that we do today, especially when we run a big company, if you do not have your hands in software uh, and, and the world digital, I'm not talking about just software, all the business models that follow um, how you build the software, uh, you're not going to be able to play the game. So uh, focus on, on your studies, uh, business administration, but start thinking that you'll need to also to specialize uh, in a way or another one in the digital world, otherwise it's going to be extremely complicated. Terrific. Thank you. I appreciate it. And I can only underline this. We, we launched uh, just a couple of years ago our joint uh, MBA engineering program and it has been extraordinarily successful in terms of I bet. So, anyway very good well uh, listen uh, francesco it was a great pleasure to have you thank you uh, for your contribution uh, this morning to this panel and uh, i wish you really the best of luck with uh, nlx it sounds like it's an important mission here and we hope to see you back in boston physically of course uh, you know, sooner than, than uh, possible, <laughs> in a way. We really hope it's going to be soon. Thank you. Thank you. I'll see you then. All the best. Thank I'll you again. I'll see you soon. Thank you. Thank Ciao. Bye-bye. Ciao. Bye. Okay. So let's see if our uh, next guest, um, Tony Volpe, is, um, is with us. I can see his, uh, there he is, beautiful background. Hello. Tony. Wow, Dante. <laughs> right, well, welcome, uh, welcome, uh, Tony. Let me say just a couple of words uh, before I, I start asking you a few questions. Uh, um, uh, Tony um, is, uh, by the way, a co-founder and, and a former member of the board of uh, Nova, uh, so uh, uh, good, uh, good pedigree here. Uh, Tony is the CEO of Falk Renewables, uh, which is one of the most important uh, European pure players in the renewable energy sector. So he's, he's really at the forefront of some of the things that we were just talking about in terms of transformation. 
Um, he is a graduate of the Politecnico di Milano. He's a Columbia MBA. Uh, also, he has a long experience uh, uh, at uh, NL, in fact, where he uh, ran uh, international operations such as uh, the Romanian operation. And of course, Anna Green Power here in Boston. So uh, I, it's, it's good to see you again. And welcome back to Boston, uh, as I just said to Francesco, uh, who, who was there before you. So uh, it's good. Uh, it's really good to see you. Um, so we're talking about, uh, we only have, unfortunately, 15 minutes or so. And I know that we could be with you for, for a long, long time. Um, and, and of course, we, um, we're talking about all of the issues that surround uh, the uh, energy industry here. As I was saying, you're at the forefront uh, with, uh, with you know, your uh, engagement on the renewables. Um, do you want to uh, give us some, uh, some views on that? Uh, you know, where is the renewable energy going? Uh, what is the role you're playing? Maybe you can tell us a little bit more about FARC itself to start with, and then, um, yeah, we'll take it from there. Absolutely. Well, first of all, it's a pleasure to be with you guys. It uh, so brings back a lot of memories. Um, yeah, I started off with Nova almost 20 years ago. I was in charge of... Uh, of the t-shirts, you know, that was my first job at the first conference, um, second conference actually. So, uh, but anyhow, it's great to see that this association uh, has been going on for so many years and uh, with such a, a great enthusiasm. Uh, so it's, uh, it's really fantastic. So going to uh, renewables, FARC Renewables is essentially a company that fundamentally develops new projects, builds them, operates them. Uh, of course, we own um, a lot of them on our balance sheet, but more and more, we're evolving into a platform, basically, that is going to enable further investments also from other players. As an example of that, for example, we put together a partnership with ENI in the US uh, to be able to develop projects together, and we're going to then uh, sort of split the projects among us. So we enabled ENI to enter this space and enter that market, which was a little bit uh, different. In parallel to that, we observe a huge transformation of the renewable sector, which uh, used to be uh, driven by incentives. And so it was essentially pushed by regulators. And it's now transforming into something that is driven purely, if you want, or more and more by demand of green electricity as a mean, as a way to offset carbon emissions. So it's going to become, and it is already in most of the countries, I would say, a uh, consumer-driven sector. Um, some people might call that commoditization, if you want, of the renewable space. Um, but that's where you need to play, and that's you know, and you need to change quite a bit in your company to be able to be success successful at it. Uh, I think Francesco and Torini touched upon the digitalization aspect. I think that is an important aspect for for each and every player. I don't think you will see many players uh, in any segment of the value chain that will not digitalize significantly uh, in the next years. And also, you know, being able to understand that the real issue is not to, you know, have more renewable generation, but to, you know, uh, reduce the emissions uh, uh, in, in the way we use energy pretty much across all sectors um, uh, today. So um, electricity, renewable electricity is one of the solutions. And of course, we think and we think electrification is going to be big and demand for it, green electricity is going to include, but you cannot also forget about uh, other sectors that you cannot decarbonize with electricity and where you're going to need um, different fuels, green fuels. Now, I know Marco Alvera is probably going to be talking a little bit about uh, you know, green hydrogen, but that's sort of part of the picture. So it's that, it's energy efficiency. Um, so it's a mix of things because the challenge to go to net zero, which is, you know, the, you know, the European target 2050, uh, hopefully the target already of many countries uh, in Europe, you know, Finland, Sweden, um, and so on. Um, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a gigantic task. So, um, you know, you need to completely redesign the way you use energy in each and every sector. So, you know, that's great for our sector. We see big growth, you know, renewables are already big in Europe. They're going to be bigger. They're going to be bigger in the U.S. and in, in each and every continent. So for us, we see this is a uh, you know extremely interesting uh, space. Um, but again, it requires a lot of coordination and work among among all the players, if you want, uh, in the industry space. 
Well, talking about that, uh, how is Italy doing? Uh, you, you talked about, you know, the European goal of 2050, of course. There's a letter that you signed of, uh, you know, the CEOs of, uh, for, for 2030. So there is this Green New Deal, if we could use the word. Um, how is Italy doing? How's Europe doing? Uh, and and what is, uh, what's the role of your company, I guess, in that? Well, look, all in all, Italy and Europe are doing well. In particular, Italy is one of the few countries that met um, the 2020 target in terms of uh, renewable energy um, and actually did it before others. Um, so, so far, so good. Uh, but the real challenge is, you know, how to get to the 2030 targets because Europe has 2030 targets in terms of renewable energy, CO2 emissions, energy efficiency, and so on, and then go further ahead with, you know, net zero targets. Or, um, and, you know, we are at a, at a point where there's a lot of excitement in the investor space. You know, there's never been as much excitement from investors, um, you know, and uh, it, it's been extremely, if you want, convenient for company like us to finance our businesses. We just issued, for example, a convertible bond which had negative yield. So, you know, uh, but I, again, on the other hand, however, if you want to have, um, you know, so many other wind farms and solar plants and offshore, um, you're going to have to somehow accelerate uh, the permitting processes um, and, and the many bureaucratic aspects that make essentially uh, make development of new projects extremely lengthy today and very difficult. So that's the conundrum. Now, some people say, you know, you can simply centralize the decision making process. So, you know, and make sure that, you know, you give permits, um, you know, because somebody decides in Rome or in Brussels or somewhere else. Um, our view at FARC is that, you know, you still are going to have to find an extremely sustainable way to do that. And sustainable, sustainable means you need to take into account the views of the many stakeholders. And you need to make it such that new projects will create value um, for all the stakeholders involved, in particular, the communities that host the project, because they, those are the ones that have the, the, the biggest impact from you know, visibility impact. You know, they see it, it's in their community. Um, and so they need to benefit uh, you know, significantly from that. And so this model of shared value creation, if you want, which we think is at the core of you know, a bigger number of installations in the future, is still not the prevalent model, if you want, uh, in the industry. And so uh, people like us and others need to really start pushing a lot more for models like that. Thank you. That's interesting. Uh, on, the, on the negative yield uh, convertible bond, congratulations. I think it's wonderful. At the same time, it's a little scary. We could have a long conversation as uh, you know, uh, my thoughts on where real interest rates are. Anyway, that's a long story. But uh, going back to, to the point that you make, which is really interesting, which is that you know, there's a number of constituencies here that uh, you are addressing, right? You mentioned the communities, the not in my backyard, uh, uh, you know, the reverse, that's what you're trying to do. But also there's politicians, regulators, and so on and so forth. What kind of tools do you use to promote your vision, your long-term vision, and try to influence the various stakeholders uh, in the right uh, direction? Well, we do a few things. First off, it's important when we start developing a project to do it ourselves in first person. You know, the, in the, in the industry in the past used a, a number of players which would concentrate in the earlier stage developers and then big companies would buy the projects. We think you need to be there from day one because you need to create that relationship with the landowners, with the community, uh, so that they trust that you are going to be a, the company that actually develops the project owns the projects and maintains it um, so that they can essentially uh, have, um, you know, somebody to talk to that is not going to run away and go do some, some, something else. So that's step one. The second is to sit down with them and make them understand that we are willing to essentially open up uh, part of the profits of the project to them, you know, and we can do that in several ways. We've done it in several ways. Either uh, members of the community become stakeholders, you know, so essentially they become a mix between shareholders and debt holders, so they are protected shareholders, preferred shareholders, or simply, um, you know, the wind farms generate uh, um, a community benefit funds that they can decide what to spend. Um, one of the things that we are very um, picky about is that 
if the wind farm, for example, pays a certain amount of money to a fund uh, in, in, of, of, of that community, we make sure we are not the ones deciding how they should spend that money. We want them to create an association of citizens that you know, is empowered to decide exactly you know, how and when to spend that money. It turns out actually that most of the time, the projects that they elect to do with that money are sustainable projects, are in turn projects that decrease the carbon footprint or generate jobs which are going to do that in that community. So there is a, a benefit also in creating, if you want, a certain level of local entrepreneurship, uh, which we think is, um, is crucial. And with that also, we do another thing, which is we create a direct dialogue with the community and not necessarily only a dialogue that goes through the local institutions. Uh, so the, the town hall, for example. It's important also to bring on board the town hall and every other uh, sort of government entity stakeholder, but you need to have that direct access Be because you know there's a difference of perspective. If you're speaking to the association of people living in that area, you're speaking to somebody that really has a long-term interest. If you're speaking to the, uh, may, uh, you know, the, 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 the elected officials of the uh, town hall, you know, they might have five-year time horizon, but they are politicians, so they might not be there forever. So they, there's a different perspective there. So these are the few things we've been historically doing in the UK. Falk has been, in a way, an innovator back in 2005, 2006. Not everybody does it, but, you know, we've been trying to export uh, this model, uh, you know, in other countries. We've done it in Sweden, in Norway. Uh, when we entered, we're doing it in France, in the Netherlands, and in Italy as well, of course. Uh, you need to adapt it, of course, you know, because there are a lot of details in terms of you know legal details but it can be done and and so that's that's the approach we have Terrific. no no thank you it sounds like a, it's a, a full-time job just uh, just to make sure that you you dance with all the constituents here uh so that's uh, that's an interesting uh, insight um we just have a couple of more minutes uh, and as i asked francesco um you know we have a lot of, uh, of young viewers here today and uh, uh do you want to spend a, a word on uh, where you find talent and uh, how they should think about their future, uh, you know, particularly in the en in the energy uh, industry? Sure, uh, you know, I'll try. I don't know, you know, but uh, it's always difficult, difficult question. But look, at the end of the day, I think it's about uh, you know understanding what it is that really motivates you, uh, you know, and and really create a purpose. Um, with with your job that goes beyond you know just you know uh, you know being paid well or sort of every, be, having a career ambition but i think you need to do something that where that brings benefits um beyond that you know where you see uh, the meaning of what you're doing as a greater societal uh impact if you want um so we like people like that and i think also people like that are the ones that can contribute more to the company because they're going to be more creative they're going to have more ideas they're going to be excited about what we do so from an employer standpoint what is crucial for me is to create the environment to be able to attract uh, people like that but when i see that spark when i see somebody that not only went to the mba not only of course has a great network and knows how to expand it and cultivate it also had that has that sort of a purpose-oriented mentality and approach um you know sort of that's the one person I'd like to have, you know, and in, in my organization, if I manage to have people like that, you know, it becomes um, very, very exciting, exciting. Um, you know, if I look back at myself, I, I didn't have that clarity, you know, and many times in my, in my career, I think I have it now, you know, what I do excites me, you know, I do it, you know, because it's a great job, it's a great industry, but also I'm doing something that really feels like, you know, is beneficial for future generations. Um, so I wish I had a clearer vision there. I think that the resources people have to, today allow them to, to do that better, but they need to really focus on themselves and not so much on the outside world, you know, uh, really think about who they are, what they're good at, and what really, you know, sort of pushes them ahead to get better and better at what they're doing. Fantastic. Thank you so much. These are great words of wisdom. I'm sure that uh, many of our uh, viewers uh, will uh, uh, heed uh, them. So uh, so thanks again. It was lovely to see Thank you. you. Uh, so I, I hope to see you back in Boston uh, in person uh, soon. All right. All right. Thank you. All the best and good luck with Thank what you. you're doing. Bye-bye.
All right, so let's swiftly move on to our uh, next speaker who is upside down. So, uh, Marco, I don't know what's happening, but you need to kind of 90 degree yourself uh, the other way around. Actually, I'm now 180. Uh, yeah, okay, you're getting there. Okay, there we go. Thank you very much. We now see you very well. Welcome. It's great to see you, uh, Marco. Thank you for taking a moment on your Saturday uh, to uh, spend with us. Um, I, um, I'm excited to have Marco. Let me just say a couple of words uh, to introduce him. Of course, uh, Marco, as you all know, is the CEO of uh, SNAM. Uh, SNAM is one of the world's uh, leading uh, energy infrastructure companies. It's a real pride uh, of, uh, of Italy. I, I did several transactions in my banking years for them, and they are, they're a wonderful company. Uh, Marco is a graduate of uh, LSE, um, and he's began his career at Goldman Sachs, where we were colleagues for a time. Uh, but then he uh, saw the light before me and soon moved to the uh, energy sector, where he uh, had a wonderful career uh, accumulating over now, unfortunately for you, Marco, over 20 years of experience. That's right. Uh, on uh, Italy's most prominent energy company since he had senior positions at Enel and, of course, at uh, Eni. Um, he, by the way, currently presides Gas Naturally, which is a partnership of uh, European associations across the gas value chain, um, and is uh, also non-executive director of S&P Global, a member of the Cheney Foundation, and also a visiting fellow at Oxford. So uh, I guess, like me, he had the desire to, to teach a little bit. I, I do more of you, more than that, I suppose, than you do. But it's great that you have that uh, you know, uh, desire. So thank you for being with us, Marco. It's, it's lovely. Thank you. Um, we've had a, a couple of conversations uh, this morning. We, we're, uh, you know, in, in this complex industry that you're in, and uh, we were talking about some of the major transformations that the industry is going through that are deep, that are dynamic. Um, and of course, we know that uh, you, uh, you, know, you, you, your brand identity is energy to inspire the world. Um, and we wanted to uh, start, I guess, by asking you a little bit, and we know that you, you've been a proponent of decarbonization and, and changing uh, fuels and particularly hydrogen. Do you want to start to tell us a little bit about that? But, you know, frankly, you, you can tell us what, whatever you, you, you feel is important at this point. But I thought that that may be a place to start. Thanks, Dante. This is a very broad question. So first of all, I'm very pleased to be back at NOVA. And thank you, uh, Dante and the organizers for uh, inviting me. I think this is a very, very important group of people for, uh, for everything that's, that's happening in our country. I think this is really a time of great opportunity. So I'd like to spend the, I think we have 15 minutes or so. Unfortunately, and, yeah. And Dante, please, uh, I, the more questions you ask, the happier. So I'll keep the answers short and keep going with the questions. And we can touch a little bit about energy, but we can do also uh, a lot about what's kind of what's going on in, 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 the, in the bigger picture with the climate and the recovery fund and all of that. Apologies for my tone of voice is very low. I've been uh, presenting a children's book that I've written to schools and uh, teaching at university. That. Teaching at universities is, is a much quieter experience than, than talking to 10-year-olds in schools. So I've been shouting for the last month and have lost my voice. So um, I, I, I was hoping to keep my phone like that, but I have to hold it with my hands. So Please, apologies. because otherwise we see you I, sideways. I have to keep it, keep it up with my hands. So the, the energy theme, I think, the climate change and decarbonization theme is the biggest challenge we have. As, as a generation. And a lot of people see that with fear, and a lot of people in the streets are protesting against taking planes, against having children, against eating meats. And um, having spent, as, as Dante kindly re remembered, 20 years in, in the energy sector, I really wanted to um, boil down my experience uh, into a theory and into uh, several books. We're now at the third book, working on the fourth, uh, where we try to bring a message of hope to the younger generations, but also to the older generations, that we don't need to think about a trade-off uh, between our standard of living and a full decarbonization, uh, because we, we now have a technology uh, which has always been available, which is out of hydrogen. The first hydrogen experiments were, were done uh, on Lake Como by Alessandro Volta in 1799. He was already producing hydrogen with the world's first uh, battery. 
And in London, in Milan, in Genova, we had um, city gas uh, at the beginning of this century, which essentially was, was hydrogen. What happened was that with the uh, advent of the oil era, and I'm, I have been a big fan of oil and gas. I've worked in ENI uh, drilling and discovering oil and gas reserves in many parts of the world. Uh, but when oil and gas really took mainstream uh, after Churchill in 1912 introduced oil in the Royal Navy instead of coal, that really triggered a whole oil revolution. And oil is a little unfair because if you were to calculate the MPV of oil, you'd come to like a, you know, a million, two million, ten million dollars a barrel because oil costs 50 bucks right now. But that oil was produced 50, 20, 30 million years ago. So, so of course, oil can always compete and oil can be produced as low as one dollar a barrel. So oil is going to be always cheaper than the alternatives. But what we have now is this ability to produce hydrogen, which behaves like oil and gas. It's a molecule, uh, but we can make it from solar energy. And I was a huge hydrogen skeptic. In 2002, I was working in NL, went to Japan, to the World um, Climate Conference and the World Hydrogen Conference were combined. Jeremy Rifkin had just written his book in 2002 called The Hydrogen Economy. He was talking about hydrogen as new internet of energy. And I came back from Kyoto after 10 days of Japanese translation thinking, I don't know what I understood, but the only thing I really understood is that technologically it works, but commercially, no way, man. It's 60 times more expensive than oil. Forget about it. And, and our brains have inertia, and I kind of lived with that thought, kind of ideal technical solution, never going to work, unfortunately, until five years ago. A colleague came to me saying, dude, we have to look at hydrogen. It's gotten a lot cheaper and really cheap, and it's going to be part of the solution. I'm like, no, don't waste your time. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not into this. It's really, really ridiculously expensive. And, and she said, no, look at the models. And I said, no, the models are wrong. Redo the models. They came back after a week, three of them, very senior people I trust in the company. And so they said, look, the price of hydrogen today made from solar is only three times the price of oil. And so I looked at their five sheets of Excel and I called home, said, I'm not having uh, dinner at home tonight. We ordered pizza. And we said, this is, this is going to change everything. No one has really focused on this. And no one is focused on this because the energy industry is a, a a whole series of loss in translation. The oil people think in dollars a barrel. The gas people think in uh, dollars for a million BTU or 1,000 cubic feet or 1,000 cubic meters. The coal people think in tons. The electricity people, you heard Venturini earlier, they think in kilowatt or megawatt. And God knows, no, no one in the oil industry knows how many kilowatt hours is a barrel of oil. And no one in the electricity industry knows how many cubic meters of gas is, is a megawatt hour. So what we've done in our theories, in our books, is put everything in the same currency, everything in megawatt hours. And we actually really saw that because of the fall in the cost of solar, the cost of making hydrogen, and this was four years ago, was only three times the cost of oil. And, and today, the cost of hydrogen has come down to two times the cost of oil. And what really excites me is that I think if we get our act together in the next five years, we can have clean hydrogen made from the sun at the same price as the cost of diesel today. And wow. that, that means we can, uh, you know, without changing our habits, we can make infinitely uh, available and sustainable energy uh, that, uh, that is cost effective as well. And uh, what we did in our theories was, okay, what do we do next? And we said, we have to avoid the mistakes of what we did with solar, which is Italy, Spain, and Germany single-handedly triggered the whole solar revolution with, with very unfair subsidies on the poorer people. Because if you put a, a subsidy on the gas bill or the electricity bill, it's a regressive form of taxation. You're taxing the unemployed, the, the older people, uh, with the same dollar amount as you're taxing the wealthier people. So it's really regressive. And, and we're still paying like something like 20 billion bucks a year just in Italy on renewable subsidies. So we have to avoid that. We said we need to come up with an amount 
of demand for electrolyzers. Electrolyzers is what you need to make hydrogen from solar and water. Water is H2O. You fill a bucket like this of water, uh, and you, you just run solar energy through it. And the energy with the right chemistry splits the oxygen from the hydrogen. You capture the hydrogen, and you can transport it using an existing pipeline. Um, so that means you can use a lot of the existing infrastructure. You can produce solar energy where it's sunny, really far away. You can produce it in Nevada. You can produce it in Tunisia. 1% of the Saharan desert of solar energy could produce enough hydrogen to supply all the world's energy needs. Of course, it's a huge area. We don't need so much, just to give you a sense. So that's really happening. We said the world needs to come up with a way to commit to 25 gigawatts of electrolyzer demand. These electrolyzers are still handmade objects. They're still quite expensive. If you standardize them, the cost will come down. Cost of solar have already come down, as, as Tony knows better than anyone. And, and this, this idea uh, became the European um, energy strategy. And so Europe is now committed to 40 gigawatts. We've launched a global alliance to get companies to sign up to commit to 25 uh, gigawatts. And so it's, it's happening. Goldman said it's a, an $11 trillion opportunity. Bank of America Merrill Lynch recently came out with a report saying uh, hydrogen is like the internet pre.com or like smartphones pre-2007. So it's, it's, it's huge. It's happening. It's, it's big and good. Well, listen, uh, first of all, t two observations, I guess. The first is by listening to you, uh, I understand where the energy to inspire the world uh, comes in, in your motto, because uh, this is uh, absolutely uh, inspirational, what you just uh, told us. And I wish, the second point is that I wish I, we had a lot more time to talk to you, because I think this is, you, you've only scratched the surface here, and I'm now itchy to learn more, and, and which I will. Um, and, uh, and, and it's just fascinating to, to, to hear uh, what you have to say. Unfortunately, I have to move the conference along because we have a bunch of other speakers uh, waiting uh, in, 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 in the wings here. But uh, before we do that, we have a few more minutes. And really, um, of all the things that we talk about, I'd like to, uh, to ask you, um, you know, to give a word of wisdom or of advice to the, you know, I think over 750 people um, uh, that, that we have listening to, to us today, uh, including many young people. You know, in terms of their future, uh, what should they think about, um, you know, both in terms of the energy sector, but more in general? So Venturini already talked about digital. I don't have anything to add. Digital is the future, of course. Uh, Tony talked about a self journey and self purpose and energy to inspire the world is a process we came through in the company to give ourselves a higher purpose. Um, I, I think to have a, a fun career in a boring sector is much better than having a boring career in a fun <laughs> sector. So stop applying to all join Google and McKinsey. I mean, there's a lot of uh, sectors and companies out there that are just waiting uh, to get the talents, uh, including SNAM. Uh, we're open for business. If you feel you are extremely talented and ambitious and you care about what I talked about, the climate, new technologies, uh, this is, uh, I think, really going to be a tidal wave that will change everything. This is like recreating the oil industry in the next... 15, 20 years, and we're starting from scratch. So there's room for everything. There's room for technology, for marketing, for infrastructure, for, for tanks, for storage, for measurements, for uh, legal procedures. And we have to rewrite the rules from scratch. So stay tuned. You can, you can uh, uh, follow us on, on the social media. You can uh, see the books. We'll be, we'll be constantly uh, with an open source approach. That's another thing I think is important is look for companies that have an open source approach. This is no longer the time where a GE can kind of have the patents and do it alone. This is time of collaboration. This is time of fluid uh, partnerships between academia, public sector, private sector. And, and uh, what's really great about the oil industry is that Exxon has 60% of their production is non-operated. The oil industry is the biggest collaborative industry I've seen. We have six, seven, eight, ten companies working together at the same project. That's kind of what we need to live up to the to the energy climate change uh, challenge. So I, I really think uh, a time for a career in energy is after 30 years of being a little dull is now probably the most exciting uh, place to be. And we're open for business and good luck to everyone. And feel free to reach out on LinkedIn or whatever to 
to have a, a personal conversation. Fantastic. Marco, I cannot thank you more uh, on behalf of uh, Nova and everybody who's listening to us uh, for this inspirational uh, chat that we had. It was just too short. That's my only big regret. But we will do it again. And uh, we wish you the very best of luck for everything you're doing, uh, both professionally and personally with your book. Uh, And uh, I would look forward to seeing you very soon. So thank you again for being with us. Grazie. Thanks a lot. Good luck to everyone. Bye-bye. Ciao. Okay. Andrea, back to you. Thank you, Professor Roshini and Mr. Abela for literally showing us what the next frontier of energy could be. And thank you also for the outstanding speakers we had before, Mr. Volpe and Mr. Venturini. Personally, I can honestly say that I feel a little bit more optimistic now about the future of Italy in the energy transition and about the future of our planet of this, these three insightful interviews. Thank you again. Now, I'm honored to introduce you to the last section of the 2020 NOVA virtual conference, Rethinking Our World Through Digital Innovation. With an outstanding panel of speakers, we will try to understand how digital can create sustainable value to society and how business leaders can foster positive externalities from innovation. We are lucky to have here four incredible speakers to guide us through this topic. First, our moderator, Harvard Business School professor, Rafael Sadun. Apart from being an expert in economics of productivity, management, and organizational change, she has also recently been a member of the Italian government COVID task force. Our first panelist is Silvia Candiani, the Chief Executive Officer of Microsoft Italy. Mrs. Candiani has deep experience in the tech and communication spaces and is also an INSEAD MBA alumna. The second panelist is Professor Roberto Cingolani. Mr. Cingolani is the Chief Technology and Innovation Officer at Leonardo. Before his experience in Leonardo, he also founded the National Nanotechnology Laboratory and the Fondazione Istituto Italiano di Tecnologia. Last, but only in alphabetical order, Mr. Diego Piacentini. Before his current role as an investor and as an advisor, Mr. Piacentini had an outstanding career in the tech space in Europe and in the US, most recently in Amazon. Mr. Piacentini has also served as the Italian government commissioner for digital transformation. Thank you all for joining us today. Before leaving the floor to our speakers, I would like to invite you to submit questions for our panelists through the Q&A function of our platform. We will try to select them for the last part of our conversation. Professor Sadun, the floor is yours. Andrea, hi, thank you so much. It's such an honor to be here today with you all and with this amazing panel. So Silvia, Diego and Roberto, lovely seeing you. Very excited to have this time to connect and discuss with you. Welcome. Um, So we'll jump straight into the discussion and we have a very exciting topic to uh, begin with which is really the value of digital innovation to society. So in this first part of the panel, we'd love to explore with you how can business leaders facilitate societal growth? How does digital contribute to societal growth? And Silvia, we thought we would start with you. Um, Given the incredible effort that Microsoft Italia and you personally are spending uh, to start uh, with the Digital Restart Initiative, Um, It's a fabulous example of cooperation uh, throughout the country between the public and the private sector. And we'd love to hear a little bit more. We would love to know a little bit more about the vision that underpins this project. And if you like also, what is the impact that you'd expect to achieve and the barriers that you think you need to overcome to uh, realize this uh, uh, the vision for, uh, for your project? Thank you, Silvia. Uh, thank you very much, and uh, in, um, great to be with uh, all of you, uh, as I uh, still remember when I was uh, doing my MBA. It's uh, great to have the opportunity to connect. Um, as you mentioned, I'm uh, very proud of um, the initiative that we launched in May 2020, which is called uh, Ambizione Italia Digital Restart, because we've been able to uh, attract a significant investment in Italy, which is uh, 1.5 billion of investment um, to uh, build uh, the cloud data center for, uh, uh, in Italy for uh, the Italian business. But as you mentioned, uh, and this investment was particularly, let's say, welcome in a moment like uh, you know, the pandemic 2020, when uh, there was a lot of worry you know, in the economy about how we would get out of the, of the crisis. But one of the things that I think is important that we took that uh, opportunity to try to make a platform investment to habilitate a digital ecosystem that can, uh, you know, all together bring innovation forward. 
And so one thing that we did, for example, we did a, a study with the Politecnico di Milano to uh, study what impact uh, this investment could make in the Italian economy. And the, um, the result of the study was that uh, the total impact in economic impact could be nine billion uh, of dollars and uh, 10,000 uh, uh, jobs. So why is that? Because if we are able to habilitate the innovation ecosystem, uh, the investment uh, um, can create more opportunities for the other players in the digital ecosystem. So the startup that can create um, solutions for the digital, uh, for the digitalization of the companies, for SMBs to grow faster, uh, and for, in general, all the players that uh, work on the digital progress. So what we decided to do is to create uh, some initiatives that would uh, um, enable us to accelerate the development of this digital ecosystem. And we selected uh, three main areas. One is the skilling, because you can have all the technology that you want, but if people cannot leverage the power of technology, we are, um, you know, uh, it, uh, it doesn't deploy any benefit to the economy. And so we um, uh, launched this initiative to uh, create the digital learning courses uh, and uh, with the ambition to train more than 1.5 million people in Italy. And it's actually going in, uh, in very well in this direction because actually people feel that they needed to update the skills and the competencies to take advantage of this uh, uh, revolution, digital revolution. So skilling would be the number one pillar uh, to really make sure that the digital can deploy benefits to the entire economy and society. Um, second uh, is uh, an enablement of um, uh, SMB and so to, uh, we are creating uh, different uh, initiatives to help uh, small businesses to envision what technology could do to them, could do for them and to have them to adopt it fast. And that's a second priority for Italy because we know that uh, you know, there are some really large companies that uh, already do a lot in terms of technological and digital transformation. But the problem also the digital state of Italy is that the small businesses, especially between 10 and 20 employees, have a difficulty in, uh, in adopting. And so we created academies to train them, to inspire them, to show them industry by industry what uh, uh, digital can, can help you achieve. Um, and created uh, alliances with different companies um, with the same purpose, um, such as uh, Unicredit, uh, Poste, Vodafone. And so we are putting together different companies with the same uh, benefit. And I think this is really, um, this takes me to the third um, pillar, which is alliances, ecosystem alliances. So for example, for we uh, identified um, green tech as a, a, an important driver, so sustainability. And uh, for that, we are putting together different companies, large and small, that have the same objective to create a cross um, fertilization of ideas between uh, different companies, energy companies, tech companies, startups, universities, in order to create uh, uh, prototypes of digital um, innovation. Um, uh, to improve the sustainability of, the, of, the, of, um, of their companies or different companies. And I think this is really the third element which is really important to somehow find ways to aggregate the different players in the ecosystem to drive towards the same uh, goal. So now we um, just started, the investments are landing and uh, um, I think that uh, this is a great opportunity, as, uh, as many others that are happening in this moment of crisis somehow, um, to uh, somehow restart uh, with the vision and taking uh, the opportunity to really accelerate uh, um, innovation with technology. And, but I think the, the, the important thing is that uh, skilling is the heart of it, so you're doing the right thing, you're studying and uploading, upgrading your skills to, um, to really take advantage of it. But the second is really alliances and ecosystem plays uh, to join forces across different companies. Silvia, this is fascinating. I mean, the aspect that I find most interesting here is the systemic approach that you're taking, which is you know, well beyond just providing the technology, but it's thinking about people, about businesses and infrastructure. So uh, really impressive. That gives me also the opportunity to ask uh, Diego a question, because in a sense, Diego, 
what you have been doing with uh, uh, you know, the agenda digitale has a little bit the flavor of uh, systematic approaches to uh, stimulate digital innovation. So of the, uh, of the uh, comments just made by Silvia, do you mind just letting us know, first of all, why did you do it? Why leaving Amazon to do it? And what are you trying to achieve? What are the challenges that, uh, um, that you think you need to overcome to realize your vision? You're still muted. Obviously, I always do of that course. all the time. No, I was saying thank you for inviting me here. This is my third Nova event. And I was looking at the first one was, uh, I guess, 19 years ago in New York or 18. So then one in Chicago and I had just joined Amazon. So uh, obviously you, you picked on a, on, a, on a probably what is the hardest transformation of all, which is the transformation of public administration. I mean, it's incredible hard, incredibly hard to transform any legacy, keeping that in mind. In some cases, it's almost impossible because you need to have an alignment of a moon, sun, and planets to make some transformations happen. So let's go, let's, let's get into the, the, the government part. The government part is uh, A, why did I do it? Because I, I had the opportunity to do it. It does sound like a geological, uh, a political geological year I go, although it was only 2016 when uh, a, a guy called Matteo Renzi, you know, uh, reached out to a few of us. And, uh, and I think also Roberto was one of those. And, uh, and, uh, and invited me to, to help this digital transformation. I thought that was a good opportunity. I thought that was, uh, since no transformation happens unless the top, either it's the CEO or the prime minister makes it happen. I think that's, a, by the way, a necessary, although absolutely not sufficient condition. I thought that given the political situation, that well, maybe it's, if there is an historical era that that can happen, it's here. God was I wrong. And uh, um, and I accepted to do it, I think, because you know, I had done you know, 13 years at Apple, 16, 17 years at Amazon. Uh, I want to honestly try to help a little bit my country and see that's, what can I put in, in practice, which is a you know, little bit of experience I built in that part. So that, that's number one, explain the reason. Number two, immediately identifying what the drivers and the obstacles are. The obstacles are that uh, uh, people don't understand what it is. I mean, it, the Italian government digital transformation started like most of the things in Italy, which is run by lawyers, by writing a code of digital law or whatever, which is completely useless. I mean, the most modern countries that have digital transformation don't need a law code or legal code to make digital transformation. And, uh, and, uh, and uh, I faced immediately the fact that I was uh, supposed to be running a digital agency. There were more lawyers than technical people, which obviously was by, you know, by beginning was an obvious failure. So that's why I asked Rancy to say, hey, I would accept it, but only if I can build my own team and, and, and try to, you know, avoid the paludi pontine. I don't know what the translation is in English, but you got that point. And, uh, and uh, he accepted that. So I built a team of about 40 people, software developers, designers, uh, people that obviously whose skills were not present in government. I mean, Silvia said, you know, it's about reskilling, which is absolutely true, but you need to start with a lot, with competent people. You cannot reskill, you can have at least some competent people in the team. And uh, the other thing is identifying some, uh, I mean, try to, 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 to break this huge problem into you know, the, the largest possible number of sub-problems and focusing on the one that we could solve. So that's why we identified some uh, uh, enablers, platform enablers like digital payments and digital identity, which obviously were just, you know, Again, some necessary conditions, although not sufficient to make things happen, we started working on those. I mean, building digital payments, building digital platforms, uh, sorry, uh, digital identity. And uh, keeping in mind that also when I joined the government, the first thing I did was uh, to see how to work and create my own destiny. Uh, why most people fail in government because they think that the machine works. The machine doesn't work. The execution machine doesn't work. Therefore, you need to build your own execution machine to make it work and identify two or three points to work on. Uh, digital identity, and here is an amazing thing. So obviously, 
it, it's it's just a digital identity, which is you know building a secure system that enables citizens with one username and one password to access as many government services as possible. On its own, as I said, it's just a small thing. It's a beginning. Uh, but we decided to start with that. Otherwise, you could keep going around and trying to solve things like world hunger. No, you need to, to identify one problem. And just to give you an idea, when we joined, digital identity did exist. I was I didn't invent digital identity for the government. I had only 200,000 users. We worked on making the product a little bit easier, more secure, better user interface. In two years, we reached 3 million or 2.5 million. Then I left. I suggested to create a bigger department or a ministry that created a Ministry of Innovation. In another two years, they went from three to five. Then comes COVID. And in six months, they went from five to 12. Why? Because as we suggested, if you make digital identity mandatory to receive money from government, which should be the secure form of transferring money, uh, people would adopt digital identity. Also the people that claim there's this digital divide. Uh, because why there's no, I mean, yes, there is digital divide, but when you make a service easy to use and necessary to manage financial transactions that increase the income of people, guess what? People will adopt. It. So this is again, this is, uh, this is just a small thing that we did. And there is probably another thousand that need to be done at the same level of importance. But that just tells you that A, it can be done, B, you need to have a ton of competent people that can make that happen and also have the heart in the right place. In fact, I mean, most of the people I hired were not working in government or people like me that decided to give you know, some time to try to you know, help government to make the life of citizens a little bit easier because that's what government is about, right? It's making the life of citizens and companies easier. If that is not accomplished, it's a complete waste of time. So we did this a little bit at the time. It's gonna take many, many years. And by the way, just to give you, one point and I'll close here. It's not about the Italian government. It's about government. Yesterday I spent two hours to try to pay taxes online in the US. And it's everything is online, but everything is clunky. Each state has their own user interface. Obviously there's no idea of digital identity. They don't even have passports in the US. So what about digital identities? So it's, uh, it's, it's really about government. And the biggest issue is that society is growing so exponentially fast in the adoption of digital services and government is a ladder around that. And that is going to be over time in much bigger issues than it is today because it has to be government, the big initial point for digital transformation. And that's where people will start adopting more and more. I mean, honestly, it should be as easy to pay your taxes online or to pay a fine or a ticket as it is to be easy to buy on Amazon. That's the ultimate goal. I mean, Diego, the fact that you were able to achieve something is uh, is really remarkable. Did you find that uh, as you were as you were demonstrating that value could be created, some of the skepticism in the government could be won just by showing that things are possible? Oh yeah, I mean, just to be clear, when the Five Star Movement won the elections, I was on the list of this guy needs to leave because he was appointed by Renzi. In the first three months, I was lucky that between they were, you know, they won the election and the government was created, it's about five or six months. I was able to go to, I mean, literally, I did probably 70 presentations from one to ones to one to many to explain what we were doing and convince them that don't throw away the good work that has been done. Whether you're from the vice term, you're from the left, the right, and the center, this thing needs to be done. And indeed, they kept me there. And then I just ended my term. They asked me to stay longer. So from that little bit of what we built, you can demonstrate, but you really need to be apolitical. Sorry, I know it's very, very hard. And, uh, and, uh, and, and, and people have to have a soul. People have to have their own sense of being. But if you work on, those, uh, on, on a thing like digital transformation, you want to do it for the goodness of the country. It needs to be completely apolitical. And that we were able as a team to demonstrate that. So, you know, listening to you, Diego, I am reminded of the experience of Roberto as well, because, you know, in a sense, Roberto, with your experience at IIT and now at Leonardo, you are also, what did you, before, you know, 
Diego was saying, building your own machine. In a sense, you had that experience too. Um, there is one aspect of that experience that I'd love to hear more about, and it brings me back to the topic of people and the importance of people. We say a lot about the brain drain, and uh, you know, here I am speaking from Boston, right in the United States. You, you have all been abroad for a long time, but you were able to bring back uh, Italians and actually also attract to Italy uh, non-Italians um, uh, scientists. And how did you do it? And what did you learn from that experience? Uh, yeah, look, uh, I think that brain drain in itself is not is not a problem. I mean, the, the real problem, the issue is to balance the in and out fluxes of talents that clearly we're not able to do in Italy, primarily because we are not attractive to, to young talents uh, all around the world. And I think my experience is, was very simple. I'm not so smart, I just copied. Uh, copied best practices and uh, I just was inspired by what I've seen when I was working in US, I was working in Germany, in Japan, and I found some uh, common practices and I just tried to import them in Italy, even though I have to say I've never seen so many lawyers around me like in Italy. And I think Diego was perfectly right in describing a, a, an anomalous situation where the strategy is done by the, by the formal uh, uh, the formal aspects and never by the content. Anyway, um, what do you want to what you need to offer to to a talent to to, to come to, to, to Italy, um, especially those not having a girlfriend or a boyfriend who is Italian. Okay, so we're talking about unbiased unbiased <laughs> scientists because that that's an important point. I mean, actually, sometimes it's very easy. Um, so first of all, good scientists they want to have a, a great um, scientific environment. This is the first point. They want to be in a in a top in a top team. Uh, it's like the soccer player. They want to be in the Barcelona, Real Madrid, whatever. I, I'm I'm not expert in soccer, but the, the team is important. And the second issue is uh, they want to to see that the place where they work uh, adopts international rules. And this is clearly very difficult in Italy. I mean, the Gazzetta Ufficiale is a monster which has been produced by uh, legal monsters. And the, the public function in itself is done uh, to create essentially uniform minimum salary but permanent model for everybody. And you see, this is killing the talents. The third thing that the scientists want, uh, want is a real plan. So they, they want to be in a place where there is a scientific vision, a scientific plan. They want to have a budget and they want to have independence, autonomy, which is just the opposite of what we call baronato. You know, I, I'm not going to bring the, the bag of my professor. I just want to exploit my, my neurons to create something new. And this is the challenge for my future career. I have to be autonomous. We must ensure autonomy to the talents. So at the fourth level only, there is the salary. And you might laugh about that. You can offer a huge salary to scientists, but if the scientific environment is not good, and if you don't offer autonomy, the scientists will not come. That's why the best people are leaving and only in and in most cases, only the mediocre people are staying because they want to have permanent job, no evaluation, with a social agreement that if you have a permanent job in Italy, you get a loan to buy a motorbike or a car or a house. But if you are a good scientist with a good salary and a non-permanent position, you don't get a loan. So in this respect, the country is counteracting against talents retained. So what we did actually was very simple. We offered five years long contract with a search committee that was international, not Gazette Ufficiale, just an international call, uh, evaluation done by international experts, a very tough evaluation at the entrance, but also after 36 months. And so only the very best could stay and could be renewed. Salary were very good. The budget for research was very clearly written on, a, on the contract and the scientists were totally autonomous. So in general, this is the way to a tenure track, very similar. Uh, but with international rules. Um, the last point I want to make is that gender was one of the key pillars of IIT. We adopted, we were the first in the world to stop the clock for maternity, uh, and we adopt family package. Of course, this does not apply to women only, but in most cases, about, uh, I mean, our numbers were 42% women and, and 58 men, which is a remarkable percentage. It's a world record, but yet, uh, we were offering a sort of a family package when, whenever possible. Sometimes the partner was a musician. Okay, in that case, it was difficult. But in most cases, scientists uh, get coupled with other scientists 
or other intellectual. So we exploit this sort of genetic uh, recognition among people. So as a matter of fact, we in 10 years, we collected 2,000 researchers. The average age was 34. 47% was from 60 countries. So this is not because I was particularly smart. I just copied what I've seen in the world. And we were able, due to the governance of the IIT, that was a, 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 a Gesellschaft, a foundation, pretty much like uh, Max Planck, Fraunhofer, we could adopt relatively easier and, and more free uh, rules for recruitment and a very severe, very severe evaluation. Today in Leonardo, we're launching the corporate labs. It's one of the most gigantic transformation of the company, moving the low TRL research at corporate level. Believe me, this is really a game changing in a, in a, in a big company, high tech company like Leonardo. I just open a call for 70 researchers a few months ago, and I got 1,000 applications. The rules are exactly the same. More than one third are from abroad, and there are other calls coming. So I think we just need to copy and to reduce the impact of the legal uh, attitude to the public service that is always existing in Italy. If we fight against this, I think we can make the country quite effective. Roberto, I think the lawyers that are online are not going to love us, but, uh, uh, you know. No problem. <laughs> we can discuss. Many lawyers are very good, actually. <laughs> I know. No, but seriously. There are, there, are so many good, there are so many good lawyers. Sure. It's hard, though, for a lawyer to be a computer, to be a computer scientist. Yeah. I think we are mentioning more the environment, right? The legalistic environment more than individual people. Uh, um, and, you know. It's really inc impressive, um, Roberto, the fact that you've been able to create this island of uh, scientific excellency. And you know, the idea of giving autonomy to scientists is, you know, it's quite, quite revolutionary in, in Italy. And now you're bringing this uh, approach also to the private sector, um, which you know, I think, again, for, for the Italian context, this seems quite, uh, quite new. Are you facing any resistance now in uh, Leonardo to, no, to in the, in the company, make this transformation? In the company, it's extremely, uh, really easier because uh, people are really uh, oriented towards the target accomplishment. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. And I think, uh, of course, you don't give to the scientists all that autonomy they can have in a, all the autonomy they can have in the research center because of, there is a clear strategic sure. plan, plan. But anyway, it was extremely well accepted in the company. The, the opportunity to have uh, we call fresh blood, you know, fresh people, new ideas coming. That was great. Whereas in the in the public, uh, I think uh, I think uh, uh, the more the institute was successful, and the more the the academy and the establishment, the academic establishment was against. And I think uh, I was uh, I had the honor to be very likely number one enemy of the system for many years. Uh, but I think this was a, a this was actually confirmation. That the model was working, and I think you are in a place where everything I said today is absolutely standard. So, oh, yeah. <laughs> no, it, academicians are normally they say, "Ah, look at the Americans, how they are good," but then as soon as you do something that looks like American, no, in Italy it should not be done. You know, this is a matter of a hypocritical behavior, and I think, uh, and I think the young people, young people should should really pretend, should really fight to get their autonomy and to have a fair evaluation. I think this is really the trick. It is nothing that my generation can do anymore. Is the young people should really demand for a peer evaluation, for autonomy, and for a clear principle of responsibility in research. I mean, the fact that we vote democratically director, to me, is a nonsense. It's like the, the, the trainer to be voted by the players. If you wanna take the responsibility of merit and the success of a research institution, you cannot be democratically voted. I'm sorry. I mean, this, I think, is the, the, the real beginning of the problem. Well, Roberto, sorry, you don't somebody... want to hear my opinion, but I'm going to say, I just Go love, ahead, please. I just love what I heard. It's like, it, it is so, it is so true. It is absolutely so true. It's, uh, it's about the quality of the people. And it's not, it's, it doesn't happen like in a democratic system through elections. I mean, thank you, Roberto. Thank you, guys. Well, Roberto, I, again, I, I hope somebody's listening. I mean, there are islands of excellency that are, you know, growing, hopefully. And uh, that's, that's, you know, 
gives me a lot of hope. I, I'd like to shift, if that's okay, the conversation a little bit more towards the broader uh, topic of uh, technology and in particular of technological companies. Uh, as I'm sure you all know, uh, there is a big, there, you know, there is an intense policy debate about not just the benefit of the big tech giants, but also the potential, um, uh, you know, maybe unexpected effects on society, on competition, and you know, data protection and so forth. Um, I, I'd love to to hear uh, Diego your perspective on this because you've been. Uh, at both, you know, both sides, both in the private sector and and in the private uh, and in the public sector, um, how do you think? What are do you think the key characteristics of an ecosystem where tech giants add to societal growth um, and um, uh, you know uh, drive benefit not just to themselves but to the broader ecosystem? Uh, do you think there is something that we should change from a an institutional perspective, for example, are there conditions for competition? Do they need to be modified somehow? What are your broad thoughts on, on this topic? Okay, so this is a, a conversation that obviously would require, you know, probably the whole conference to talk about it, but uh, trying to stay away from the cliches of, uh, of uh, the easy cliches of that. First of all, I think there's always this tragic mistakes on talking about Amazon, Apple, Google, Microsoft, and put them all together. I mean, each one had their own identity. They've grown different things. Three out of four have different business models. So mixing all those companies together, I think it's it, it creates what the misunderstanding is about. By the way, I also want to, since I'm here, Sylvia, I want to make compliments to Microsoft because five years ago, I would have bet money on Microsoft becoming like IBM. And you were able actually to transform yourselves, which is, I think, an amazing. It's, it's, it's yeah, it could, have been, it could have been the next IBM or the next Kodak. And instead, they, they gained a lot. And that's, that's great. Um, so I believe, first of all, all those companies are demonstrating that it's not about decreasing marginal efficiency, but it's increasing marginal efficiency. This is what's about the economies of scales at, at at, their, at, the, at the level of those companies that are, that are reached are done because of the great capabilities in terms of technology, both in terms of vision and operational excellence. Okay, especially the ones that I know, which is Amazon and Apple, but above all, Amazon. Now, at this size, those companies cannot be uh, thinking that just by acting for optimizing shareholders' value, the good of society happens. It's no longer like this. It's, it's just the size of those companies, the size of Amazon, the size of Google, the size of Microsoft, the size of Apple, but you can add more to that, is such that those company, at some point, need obviously to be scrutinized and they should welcome scrutiny. So this is true in the abstract, the point is, how? How, how, do, how do you do it? How can you make it happen so that you create a positive effects and not you know, negative downsides of any attempt of regulations? So that's, and I don't know what the answer is. It's, uh, it's, uh, and, and I think it's gonna take again because we're talking to start by saying, hey, governments are not digital. So how can you have a non-digital government scrutinize the most digital companies? I know this yeah. is again, it's an abstract statement, but you get the point I'm trying to, I'm trying to make. But, but the answer is yes. They got to the size where obligations towards society are not just about maximization of shareholder value. That's that's the and the conversation should start from here, and they should I think also they should cooperate with governments, but there is still too much of a hostile environment towards these companies, and honestly also towards companies thinking that wasting time talking to governments is just you know I don't have time for that life is too short to talk to wow. people that don't understand me. So that kind of thing needs to change. On top of that, you get the political environment that we have today, especially in the US, that creates a huge amount of confusion. Uh, I, I, most of you have probably attended the debate where the last one, the Senate was interrogating you know, Jeff Bezos and, 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 the, and, the, and the head of Google and the head of Microsoft and Tim Cook, the head of Apple. And it was pathetic, but not because the content of the question, the question was smart, but because 
the democratic part was just asking questions about privacy and uh, and uh, uh, what the company could have done for the society. And the Republican were all about the fact that you companies don't support the conservatives, support only the progressive. So yeah, the questions were hyper polarized. Break? Yeah. So how can you how can this how can we have those people regulate? So that's the biggest point. And this is going to take many, many years. There's going to be a lot of mistakes. Things will happen. I can't predict what is going to happen, but the process will have to start. And, uh, and uh, the antitrust laws need to be changed. So we do need lawyers here. It's very smart people to understand what transformational changes. And it's going to be the next few years, it's going to be a lot about what government, what public administration right. can help citizens in general to not be, I mean, you all watch the social network, right? To make sure that well, see, if you don't watch it, it's, it's worth it. It's not, I mean, it's not everything is, is, is accurate, but it's absolutely worth it to watch. It. If you want to avoid that kind of future, there must be this relationship between government and large corporations also beyond those, which is different. So we, we will need to find a way to talk to each other productively rather than just to shift votes. I guess that's part of the that's Yeah, part although of this the is kind of mission, honestly, I think this is kind of mission impossible though, because with the, with the political system we have today, it's going to be, which is you know, about lobbying on one side and it's about optimizing for something else on the other side. I think it's going to be very, very hard. And, we'll have to live with some bad consequences of that. Silvia, I, I'd love to hear from you because in a sense, you really are in the middle of, of all this. And I, I would agree with Diego, what Microsoft is doing is really impressive, how it's changing, uh, not only its uh, range of products and services, also how it's changing its culture. Um, one aspect of uh, companies such as Microsoft is that, you know, they're, a nominal size is large, but if you think about all the partnership and the ecosystem that you were mentioning at the beginning of our conversation, you know, it becomes 10x, right? Uh, through all the partnerships, the collaboration, it's really a horizontal company, very different from the traditional vertical companies that we are we were used uh, to manage uh, uh, years ago. Um, can you give us a sense of what it means to be uh, at the top of a company like uh, Microsoft. How does that change the way in which you think about value creation? How does it change the ways in which you think about value capture? And you know, how do you adapt to these different needs? Yeah. Yeah, thank you, Rafael. And uh, maybe first, if you allow me, I want to maybe respond to, some, to the question before as well, because I think it was, uh, it was noted. Um, so on one side, yes, uh, uh, I'm pretty proud of the Microsoft development, but also the fact that uh, we were not uh, one of the companies called by the Senate uh, um, because just because of the fact that uh, somehow uh, we decided as a business model to um, not to have any competing business model like, such as advertising or um, you know uh, e-commerce just to concentrate somehow in giving tools and services to the companies to digitally transform and not to compete with them. So somehow the business model choices done at the beginning have made have put us less at the center of this kind of debate. Um, and I think that probably is part of the history that we went through. You know, we probably longer history, went through many different uh, seasons and uh, understood also the need to really have that uh, mature political debate with institutions and governments um, a, few, uh, a few years ago. And that helped us to shape the company in a way that uh, um, really drives ecosystem and drives economic benefit and surplus in the country where we operate, because that's the only way to earn a license to operate, really. Uh, and I think that's, that's important. And maybe the second comment now is that uh, there is a whole discussion now in Europe, and not so much in the US, about how do we um, work with the American companies or uh, Chinese companies, and do we create a, a European uh, a footprint in digital, for example. And I think there is really important to, um, to have a balanced point of view in a sense that uh, if Europe were to go completely, let's say, protectionist and creating their own cloud, creating their own 
um, uh, let's say, digital properties that could be detrimental because what they need to do, uh, what we need to do as Europeans is to leverage the investment in the technology coming from all over the world, but put rules so that the, the value creation from data, from technology um, makes Europe richer. But it's not going back to protection even saying, you know, it needs to be done here to be European. You, to be European, you need to work alongside the rules of Europe to create value in Europe. But I, I don't think it should be, um, it would be the right choice, even technological feasible, <laughs> technologically feasible, I think. But anyway, not the right choice for the benefit of Europeans, for the development of uh, the European economy. Having said that, um, uh, it is true that uh, operating in a company like mine, a platform company, is somehow different. Um, I used to work at Vodafone before. I had, uh, you know, I was running a department, and I had all the different levers. You know, I had uh, people working for me, uh, my channels, my communication, my product, and everything was somehow uh, done by my company. Um, and then, when you move to a platform company, you only um, uh, you are an integral part, a, a very substantial part of a product uh, that is done by an entire chain of, um, uh, of players. So you have to think ecosystem. That is, uh, I have the, you know, the Lego blocks of digital technology, but the final products and the digital services are created by my customers with the help of uh, um, an ecosystem of partners that, for example, in Italy, it's uh, 300,000 people. So uh, in Microsoft, there are, in Microsoft in Italy, there are 1,000 people, there are 300,000 that work in the ecosystem on my technology to deliver products and services to uh, the market. And so what does it take? First of all, it create, um, you need to think, you need to have a, a vision, a North Star, so that, uh, for example, the Digital Restart Program, where, why, why are we here? You know, what is it that uh, we want to achieve to create, uh, to accelerate uh, the digital transformation of the country, of our customers, um, and to be very clear on the, on the vision and, on, and also on the, how we're going to do it, because whatever we, um, we plan needs to, um, to be able to create value and profit for all the elements to think how it's going to be uh, adopted by the coders, by the developers, uh, by the partners, by our customers. And um, you know, somehow you need to think systemically about an initiative in order to make sure that all the parts of the system go in the same direction. On the other hand, though, when this works fine, when it works properly, it's an incredible uh, leverage point because uh, uh, one initiative that we can uh, think centrally can uh, you know, go much faster uh, and be, at the end, much better because of the power of the network. And so I would say that, uh, on one hand, it's important to think, uh, um, uh, to think strategically, so to give this end vision and uh, uh, the objective, uh, and then to really be able to open to uh, work in an open, an open way, collaborative way, internally, but most importantly with the ecosystem itself. So sharing information, create in the point add to the values and effort, not try to you know be um, somehow everything for us, but to really create value for the system. Um, but then, and when this works, and I think it's now a really uh, deploying impact, um, it's uh, incredibly powerful to accelerate and to, um, and to have a broad impact. You know, what's interesting, Silvia, is that you basically control, I mean, you, you have the ability to uh, move the actions of many companies that you cannot directly control. So in a sense, you have to you know, steer them in the right direction, but giving them the autonomy to effectively choose, you know, whatever they need to do, which takes, uh, takes enormous, enormous skill. How long did it take you to make that transition? Uh, as it's you about be impact and influence. Yeah. yeah. It's all about impact and influence and, and studying the system it can create value yeah it's I, i'm gonna go to uh roberto now because i mean this uh, 
uh, mentioning of autonomy made me think of your comments earlier, Roberto. You know, applied, autonomy applied to the companies rather than people, but, you know, there is a certain analogy there. Although I'm going to ask you a completely different question, and it relates to the value and the use of data. So I'm sure that as a scientist and, you know, don't give us secrets, but I'm pretty sure that, at Leonardo, you might be thinking about the value of digital, the value of, uh, uh, of data in uh, adding um, you know, maybe new features or adding capabilities to uh, legacy product. Um, what I find interesting in this, um, uh, you know, in this space is the fact that there is also a very delicate trade-off. On the one hand, we realize that by accumulating and collecting data, we can create value. And then on the other hand, you, see, you also hear people freaking out and being very concerned about privacy and uh, who owns the data, for example. These are really hard policy discussions. I don't think that we have an answer to all, to all, the, to all of that. Now, how do you think about these issues? How do you think about, for example, the value of data and what you do? And what are the boundaries that you create for yourself as you, um, as you create products that, that are data intensive? Um. So, Rafaela, if there is no uh, alternative questions and I'm forced to answer, uh, <laughs> I, will try, I will try to answer uh, at different levels. I think I have, a, I have an answer as an Italian citizen and I have an answer as a sapiens, okay, as a, as a homo sapiens. I start with Italian citizen because this is possibly less than sapiens. Um, from my point of view, uh, we should see uh, the numbers. Uh, Europe produces something, something like one zettabyte per year of data is 10 to the 21, so 21 zeros. It's it's an immense amount of data. These are recent data. And Italy contributes to this amount of data by more than 20%. That means we use a lot our mobile devices. We produce a, a lot of data. I'm not saying all the data are useful, but this is a matter of fact. We produce more than 20% of those data. Now, if you see the per capita computational power in Italy, it is about one third of the one in Germany. That means that we have a lot of information, so we have a big book, but we're not able to read it. So the first thing that worries me a little bit as Italian, it is that we need desperately an infrastructure, which is not only for accumulating, producing and accumulating data, but it's also for understanding data. I mean, issues like privacy, of course, matters a lot. But it depends on the situation. I mean, when we're comparing privacy rights versus health, I mean, this was the long discussion about Immuni app, or even worse, uh, we, in the name of privacy, don't disclose information about the terroristic attack. Well, at that point, I think privacy should be second order. Maybe in other situations, not. We should be flexible enough to study case by case and situation by situation, what is the definition of privacy? Um, so all of this is, is, is feasible. What are the moment we are missing is not rules. I mean, of course we need rules, but before rules, we need an infrastructure. We need a, a, a very diffuse culture about digitalization, data capability to exploit the data. Diego was, and also Silvia were mentioning before, fantastic initiatives, uh, digitalization of public administration, or using digital platform to reskill people. I mean, that, that's very important, but I want to add the digital technologies for public health, for predictive uh, medicine. I mean, I remember I made a, a proposal many years ago and I mean, everybody liked the idea, but unfortunately it was not successful because this was, un, was touching uh, some of the uh, conventional interest of the pipeline of the health uh, uh, sector. So, you know, when you want to make a change, you have to be very careful because this is going to touch um, very well established uh, area, situation, uh, processes. So those changes are very, very relevant, are mandatory, but sometimes difficult to apply. Um, I want to make another, another example. I live in Genova. You know, this city is famous because bridges are collapsing here and 43 people die on August 14. Okay. And after the second day of rain, another three bridges uh, fell down, uh, maybe one year after the, the, the tragedy of the Morandi Bridge. So you understand that by uh, an advanced use of uh, data collected by satellites and sensors and cameras, vibration sensors, 
and using algorithms in, in the proper way, you could predict those things, you could monitor. I mean, I would launch immediately global monitoring uh, uh, program in Italy for um, monitoring critical infrastructures, for safety, for land erosion, for water, I know the Laguna in Venice or whatever, the river. I mean, these things are saving life, but also we would save money. I mean, I think Nation, United Nations evaluated something like uh, uh, 1,700 billion, the cost of the uh, consequences of the climate change in terms of catastrophic events like uh, heavy rains of uh, rainfalls, stormfalls. I mean, this is money that we could use much better for doing other things more useful if we have the capability to predict. That's why I like the data. The second point that I want to tell you uh, concerning my, my homo sapiens position. Okay, I'm a, I'm a, uh, I admire the big digitals, okay? I mean, those companies uh, were able to change in the last 20 years by far more than humans could change in the last 5,000 years. So definitely, they did a fantastic job and I'm totally admired because they brought in new ideas, new concepts. Um, I think that the real point is that for the first time, those digital technologies, uh, uh, in general, for the first time, technology was not used to augment physical performances of homo sapiens, but the intellectual performances. So acting through the connectome, they made, our smart, they made us smarter, more connected. I would say somewhat more intelligent. So all this should be commended. We should acknowledge this. On the other hand, we should be intellectually honest and unbiased. Accepting the fact that the return of investment of a digital company today is 37. I mean, I think it's too much. This is not physical. So possibly this will be slowly recovered in time, will be renormalized. But obviously now it sounds a little bit market wise to accept that the digital um, investment gives a, an ROI of 37. Whereas if you built an aircraft or a satellite of a car, and if you're lucky, you have an ROI of three or two. Uh, on the other hand, there is another point we should face, and I think in this, this, this needs a, a mature society. When the product looks free, then very likely the product is you. And this is what happens today. And I think, of course, not all the digital is doing this, but I think this also needs some discussion, needs some thinking. In the interest of this very important uh, um, segment of technology for the future of humanity on one hand, but also in the interest of the citizens. I don't think this, these problems are uh, impossible to fix. We just need to sit around the table uh, and, and to have a mature and, and aware discussion. So this is my dream, my challenge as homo sapiens, as a scientist. The other one was as Italian. And the last thing I want to say is that in Italy, we should immediately start a massive campaign to create 20,000 new digital experts. Because even though tomorrow we reinforce our cloud, we reinforce our HPC, we reinforce our cybersecurity, we can reinforce everything with the money, but then we need the brains. And at, at the moment, we are missing a lot of brains. And this is something for the future that is absolutely important. I would say I totally agree. And that's why, you know, when I was hearing the initiatives that Sylvia and Diego were discussing before, which really had uh, people at their core, I mean, those type of initiatives give me, a, give me a, lot, a lot of hope because we're talking about technology, but at the end of the day, we are talking about culture, we're talking about skills, we're talking about a lot of the soft aspects in society that uh, cannot just be moved by, by money. So this is a really, thank you so much for this fascinating uh, Rafaela, conversation. Can I have one, yes, please, one yeah, thing? No, sure. Uh, starting with the first point of Roberto, my major failure at the government has been trying to build a common data analytics framework. It's been a major failure because the problem was obvious. You know, there are 12,000 admin public administrations, including your know, schools and everything. Each one of them had their own database. Well, most of them don't have it, but each one had their own database. Look at what happens with health in owned by the regions, right? There yeah. is no interconnection, interconnectivity among those 21 databases. But the simple idea of solving that problem I made a strategic and a tactical mistake. Tactical mistake, I undertook a project that was way too hard for me and my team. But the strategic mistake was I was just going against so many modes of people that wanted to defend their own database. Because if you own your own data, you think you can control. 
and therefore there is no way you want to open it up to others simply because you don't understand not not because you're a nasty person right and 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 i got immediately the the privacy regulators against that project so it is the whole interoperability of data is a major issue that both governments need to solve. And then you get into obviously people control, life control. It's complicated, don't get me wrong. It's really complicated. I'm not trying to accuse the privacy regulators neatly. It's a very, com I would never want to be the privacy yeah. regulator. It's too complicated of a job. But that, that was just to give you a concrete point of something that as a digital team and myself first completely failed at. Yeah, I mean, it's really interesting because the type of resistance that you face is basically informed by fear of losing control, which is one of the major, major obstacles, I think, for innovation to sort of take root, um, take root in organizations and in the in countries more generally. Yeah, that plus the fact that it's a really hard problem. It's, I mean, yeah. it's not an easy problem. Yeah, so on that note, <laughs> I'm not sure if it, it would have been fantastic to have it. So. Sorry, Sylvia, I didn't get, I didn't catch that. No, I just uh, said that it would have been great with the pandemic to have that kind of uh, database of all the data for you know all the hospitals from all the regions. So I think we should be doing it sooner or later. Yes, that's oh, it, the the hope is that the the fact that now we understand how valuable that would be, we're able to you know shift and win some of the of the resistance. That's the hope. So I want to ask uh, one final round of uh, lightning questions before uh, before we say goodbye. And I you know I have to say I don't know about you, but I found this conversation among the three of us so interesting. Everybody bringing like a different perspective. And all of you are trying to do something very concrete for the country. So really, thank you. That's really incredible. Um, I want to make sure that we also uh, give some very practical advice to the people who are hearing us. Um, and uh, I guess two quick questions. I realize that we might need more time, but just give me your highlight uh, uh, comment. Two questions for you. So the first one is, if it were up to you, how would you spend the recovery fund? Question number one. And question number two, if you were finishing your MBA today, what would you be doing next? So uh, let's start with Silvia. Silvia, what do you think? <laughs> well, in terms of the direction, I think that uh, green uh, digital uh, are very important. Uh, they, they're already a part of the plan, but I would pivot even more in terms of what are we going to do for youth? So uh, in terms of both uh, um, really um, setting and reinventing, putting much more money on education as a whole, uh, reskilling for people that are already in the, um, uh, in the workforce, and uh, probably some incentives for getting um, uh, youth uh, uh, into the workforce. So, so that would be the area that I is still, it's in the program, but I would probably you know, enlarge it versus where it is today. Do you do we also respond to the second question now or quickly or, go ahead do yes go I'll do a, I'll do a round for everybody before we say goodbye <laughs> okay um, for the second question so where would I work uh, I think when I started working I went into consulting and I thought that was uh, a great uh, option today I will go in technology uh, because somehow um, this is uh, the way to really understand uh, what is going to drive uh, the development and the um, and the change in the society. It, it, of course, you know, a company like mine is great, <laughs> and, but uh, in general, I would say technology, be it a startup or be it a large company that has uh, uh, interesting initiatives on uh, technology and digital, I think it's important to learn it uh, early on because it can be a great uh, accelerator for um, the career uh, and also Thank for you. really shaping the impact that you have in the world. Thank you, Thank you Silvia. Diego. I'm mute. I did it. Uh, first of all, I'm very pessimistic on uh, uh, the capability of governments to spend money because I've seen it. They don't have they don't have the logistics and the operation machine to spend the money effectively. So that's the biggest part. But let's consider that for a moment it's flawless. They know exactly how to spend the, the make money spend. 
I would keep investing on things that already work in Italy to make them work much better. I've said that in a couple of interviews. Uh, usually, throwing resources and money at things that don't work to try to make them work is a waste of time and resources. It's, it's easier to get results to double down, triple down when things already work to make them work much better. So, okay. give me one concrete goes, example. Oh, that goes from, you know, either the fashion industry to the energy manager. You heard Anna. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's the kind of mechanical industry, space, things that Italy can work on. And I'm just not talking about food and fashion. But by the way, food technology and fashion technology is a big deal. But make sure that we can create employment, we can create innovation on the things for which Italy is already good at versus trying to resuscitate industries that in theory create jobs, but we're not going to be competitive. So that's the one. And this, yeah, sorry. the second one. The second, first of all, you're talking to someone who did not do an MBA. I did my undergrad in two months before to go to the University of Pennsylvania to, by the way, do a master in, in transportation. So I was going to go directly. I got a job offer at Fiat. I went to work there. Then I went to work in, uh, at Apple. And that was my, at the end of my MBA or master yeah. dreams. So it's the value of serendipity, which beats the value of doing an MBA, that's for sure. But definitely, I, I would, and I'm so happy that Bocconi is doing this. Uh, it's, it's about the merge of humanity with technology. And that's what is going to be the most important preparation for a, a student in business. Thank you, Diego. Roberto, I'll finish with you. I don't think you did your MBA either, right? So let me tell you. Not that you need more education, but. No, I'm, 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 I'm happy like this. Uh, I think <laughs> if I could stop now, I go back to my original, um, my original hobby that was the drawings. You know, I was a comic, uh, comics uh, drawer, and this is my passion over the life. So maybe I would go back to this and not, not studying anymore. Concerning the recovery fund, um, look, uh, I think that. Uh, uh, one of those things I, I, I actually contributed already, it's, it's a 40 billion plan for three years uh, for, um, uh, I, I, I denominated uh, Italia Digitale 2030, 25% is in infrastructure and 75 on, um, you know, long-term programs, like I mentioned before, global monitoring, uh, digital health, digital PA, industrial um, digitalization, and so on and so forth. Uh, I would, I would definitely uh, invest 100 billions on uh, physical infrastructure in the country, land, cities, transportation, uh, environment. Uh, this is this is really imperative. Uh, I would put 30 billions on research, education, and school, but only if there is a, a dramatic change of rules. Uh, not adding money to a system having the rules that not allow to optimize the use of the extra resources. So this should be really Either or, uh, then I would put uh, I would put uh, thirty billions on a, on a special program industry and small medium enterprises. Uh, there are big needs, not only space, food, and tourism, but also uh, supporting the supply chain of the big companies. This is a must, uh, and we, we should realize something. We should make something to support the supply chains of big companies and also to reinforce the uh, SME uh, pipeline. And this is two hundred billions. So I'm left with 9 billions, 10 billions, and I would use the, those 10 billions for a special program for young people. Whatever, whatever it is. Investing in intelligence, no matter whether artificial or natural, it's a good investment. And we have to do yeah. this on young people. I have some ideas, but of course, nobody asks me any ideas. So this is... <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you. Thank you. Can I say, Roberto, for present, you have already like a plan. Roberto, you should go for it. Not really. My All plan right. is the motorbike and to go around the world as soon as I retire, which will be very All soon. Right. Okay. <laughs> Thank you so much, everybody. I see Andrea coming back. I think we are getting towards the end of the discussion. Really, really grateful for your time. I learned a lot. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Grazie. Thank you, Professor Sadun, for moderating this amazing discussion. And thank you to all our speakers for joining us and for sharing some very interesting insights about digital and innovation. It has been amazing to hear how digital innovation is able to bring a real impact on society and what it takes to make it happen. With this last section, we, are, we have now come to the end of the 2020 Nova Virtual Conference. On behalf of Nova Association and of the whole organizing team, a big thank you to all our speakers and to everyone who joined us today. 
We will leave you now with the closing remarks of the organizing team directly from our business schools from the US and from Europe. Again, a big thank you to everyone. Hi everyone, this is Elisa from London Business School. A big thank you to all the numerous participants who joined us today. It was extremely nice and rewarding to see such a large interest and participation from all of you. Thank you all. Hi everyone, this is Beatrice from Columbia Business School. I want to say a big thank you to the organizing team from Harvard to MIT, London Business School and Columbia Business School. Thank you for being an amazing team in these crazy times. Hello everyone, this is Mappy and Andrea from Harvard Business School. From the organizing team, a big thank you to all the speakers who shared their wisdom with us today. Hi everyone, this is Alessandro. I'm a second year MBA student at MIT Sloan. And I'd like to say a big thank you to the whole Nova Association for the valuable help provided and for helping us make the conference possible also this year. Thank you and hope to see you soon in person. Hi everyone, it's Ascanion from London Business School. I wanted to thank all our amazing sponsors that have partnered with us to organize this conference. It has been both a pleasure and a honor working together with you. Thank you. Hi to everybody, this is Lorenzo and Silvia from London Business School. We wanted to say a great thank you to Mentors for You for supporting the organization and for sharing the purpose of Nova's Foundation.